and um, we'll open the meeting uh, with any, actually, um, hold on one minute. I would like to open the meeting with just a really short uh, read of the mission of our Reading Public Schools, just to make sure that we're all sort of here where we are. Um, everyone has busy lives, lots going on. Um, Reading Public Schools strives to ensure that all students will have common, challenging, meaningful learning experiences in academics, health and wellness, the arts, community service, co-curricular activities, and athletics. We will lead and manage our school community to reflect the values and culture of the Reading community and guide and support our students to develop the appropriate skills, strategies, creativity, knowledge, and knowledge necessary to be productive, informed, independent citizens in a global society. Um, we strive to, of course, instill a joy of learning and inspire the innovative leaders of tomorrow. Um, so the first item on the agenda is any public input that um, is not, is related to items that are not on our agenda. So none being seen. Um, we have the consent agenda. I need to ask if any members need anything removed. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Uh minutes of the yep they've been updated since the first um the first hold on so the minutes of november 8th oh, sorry. 15th okay. it says chair robinson called i don't think i was the chair then oh all right so we'll move we'll want to move that minutes out of unless november. you i can't remember i was trying to remember whether you missed the meeting but i don't think I so i don't think so so we'll just move but you would have i would have yeah um, okay, so we'll move, remove the November 15th meeting minutes. Um, yeah, do we, I think we have to do that separately, though. Yeah. Yes, you do. So we'll approve the consent agenda without, um, need to take a vote, motion to approve the consent agenda with um, the items less than November 15th minutes. Mrs. Borowski moved that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Second. Second. Ms. Mr. Bobbin. So all those in favor? Five zero, and then let's take a look at the November fifteenth. So is it just the chair? Were you going to say? Under the point of order, were you going to say that the other minutes have been updated? I I thought that's what Mr. Robinson was going after. So I didn't know if he's seen that, but we just approved them. The December sixth minutes. Um, there was if people looked at their current packet. Actually, oh, it was two packet. packets ago. This is this is the third issue. So I think that that minutes is correct. All we need to do is really um, change the chair, Ms. Robinson. Yeah, so it's under the uh, call to order. It says, should say chair web. Mm -hmm. Called meeting to order at 5.32 p.m. Uh, can I get a second for that change? Mr. Bobbin. All those in favor for the change? That's 5-0, and um, I think we need a motion to approve. Oh. Just we need a motion to approve that one set of minutes. Motion Ms. to approve the minutes as revised. Thank you. Second. Ms. Sprowski, all approving the minutes as revised. Sorry, I, we have no money. All right. <laughs> all those in favor? I'll talk louder. Okay. So that was to, the second motion, Linda, was to approve the minutes as revised with the change of chair. Okay. Excellent. Okay, reports, we're gonna start with Mara. Hi. <clears throat> All right, so we've had a few high fives for the month of December. So each week, a senior student from RMHS who exemplifies our core values is given the high five award. So two seniors have been given the high five award so far in December. So the first person who got it was Will Hattery. So he's the four year senior class president. He's a starting lineman on the football team. He's co-president of the Model UN Club, a member of the Mock Trial Club. He's a Sunday school teacher, and his favorite class is AP Euro. Uh, the other person who got it is Isabel Molatiri. She's president of the Girls Select Choir, a member of the All Eastern Select Women's Choir, which is a very um, intense select group. She's a member of the RMHS Drama Club, and she teaches weekly piano and voice lessons as volunteer service hours. Her favorite class is creative writing. 
we also had four students in the month for December. So each month, a student from each grade who represents the core value of that specific month are chosen as students of the month. So this month, the um, core value was perseverance. So for grade 12, Kevin O'Neill received this award. For grade 11, Jessica Montero. Grade 10, Harsh Patel. Grade 9, Emily Martell. And additionally, yesterday, 30 students uh, went through peer training with the Anti-Defamation League to become of the World of Difference Club. Their next training session is in January. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. Um, we have Sharon. Any report? Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, Within the special education department, we just want to let people know that we have an upcoming CPAC meeting in February. We were hoping to introduce some of our newest staff members or some of the key roles, so that might be a meeting that some of the public want to look ahead and put on their calendar, and that'll be on February 12th. Uh, we are also working under the personnel section to fill some of our upcoming leaves of absences for a few of our elementary school psychologists. And we have some decisions made and others in the works, I guess is what I would say. So I'm working with the principals on filling those leaves. Great. Not much else to update at this point. Coming up to a big season. Um, Thank you. The next report, our assistant superintendent, where I don't have a report tonight. We're going to be doing the presentation. And Mrs. Dowd, you're just I, doing agenda items? or I have one quick item, um, and then the other two will be agenda items. Mm -hmm. One of them is in the revised packet that went out. We did include a memo on Turf 2, just as a quick capital project update, we did say that we would keep the committee informed as we make decisions as we go through the process. So the funding we received in November town meeting to do a design of turf two, we have met with um, the design firms. We've also had multiple meetings with the folks at DPW, the engineering group, the town manager, Joe Huggins and Kevin Kabuzi from facilities. And based upon all of the discussions that we have had, the decision has been made that we are going to move forward with doing the design work for turf two as it currently exists with lights. We, based upon some of the preliminary work we have done in order to extend it, it is a lo lot more complicated than originally anticipated with the grading, the water, the there are paths out there, there are various other items that would be a much more larger undertaking to do. We have also worked very closely with Tom Zaya to ensure that the field as it currently exists, we do not have any Title IX issues. So looking at the funding we have available as well as the various costs if we were to extend it, we have made the decision to engage a firm to do the design work to keep it as it is with, with lights. So we just wanted to let the committee know as we make these decisions as we go forward. And then once we have additional information, we're hoping to come back in January as part of the budget process with um, any additional updates or cost estimates. Thank you. Any questions? Um, let's see. Um, Superintendent Darty. Yes, I just have one update. It's about uh, kindergarten, both this year and next year. So if you remember last year when we were going through the kindergarten uh, enrollment process, uh, we did have a group of half-day students that uh, were reassigned to either Killam or to Joshua Eaton mm -hmm. um, for half-day kindergarten because those were the two schools that were going to have the program for that uh, for this year. Um, we sent out letters um, this past week uh, to uh, the 12 students that were uh, reassigned last year, giving them the opportunity if they wanted to go back to the neighborhood school that they were originally assigned to. Uh, so we are in the process of, of that right now, uh, as first grade students mm -hmm. next year. So we are in the process of doing that right now. We've heard from most of them. Uh, they have a deadline of January 19th if they want to either remain in the school that they're currently assigned or go back to um, their neighborhood school for their grade one year. So um, that's, that's an update of this year from last year. Next year, um, so we, we've received a significant percentage back 
of next year's kindergarten class uh, based on the census. Mm -hmm. So I would say at this point probably 95% we've received of the registrations. Um, no surprise, most of them are full day. Um, we do have about 30 right now that are half day. Um, and so we are in the process right now of uh, making sure that we can balance the class sizes across the district. The other piece of this that plays into this is uh, students that are entering kindergarten who will require uh, program services and they will be assigned to a school that may not be their neighborhood school. So we're in working very closely with Rise Preschool and other preschools if necessary uh, to make sure that we have as good of a, a picture of that as possible that students may be reassigned uh, to another school so that we can balance those class sizes as much as possible. So mm -hmm. we, we always put in the registration letter that we will have those assignments sent to parents by February 1st. So I'm pretty confident that we'll have it done by that date. Okay. Can I ask a question? Dr. Doxer. Um, I'm just wondering if you're seeing a pattern. Are most people choosing to go to their um, original neighborhood school or stay in there? Well, they don't, they don't get to choose their school. They get to Wait. choose whether it's full day or half day. I think no, I mean before. I didn't want to interrupt you. So oh, well, you're talking about for the current year. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've heard we've heard from most of them. Most yeah, most of them are going back. Yes. We we there's some we haven't heard from yet though. Thank you. So I don't know what that means. But they have till January. 19th. January nineteenth, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, and that's it. And then we have let's see any reports, Ms. Borowski, mm -hmm. Dr. Doxer. I have a Rakasa report. Yep, every, it's, everyone got that at their stations also. Okay, so we had a meeting on the 13th. It's always impressive to hear about what the um, Reading Coalition Against Substance Use is um, doing with the schools. Now they're working um, with a regional group to do a social market campaign in order to empower and inform parents of middle schoolers, how to deal with vaping. Can you hear me? Am I, okay, okay. Um, how to deal with um, substance use. And um, they're also, they're looking to fill some board positions. If you're interested, please contact um, Erica McNamara. Um, we're also looking for a full-time outreach coordinator, potential start date in March. Um, they are working, they're going to start with the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in February. This time there's going to be a regional component to it, um, which will enable us to look at how our patterns compare, our risk patterns compare with neighboring towns and communities. Um, the student outreach team at the high school that's going to be working with the middle schools around vaping issues. We have about seven kids now. I don't know if that's been updated since then, but that's really exciting. Great role models for our middle school kids and important information. Um, the director, Erica McNamara, has been going to um, the school, so she worked with the child development class around substance exposed newborns and the SROs and she are visiting ninth grade health classes for opioid prevention. Um, and we're trying to bring a certified recovery coach to this area to work with our students. And I know you have this, so. Um, and there'll be two opportunities to celebrate Julianne DeAndalus, um for her retirement. So one is on the 30, 30th with the police and the other is at the board meeting on the 31st. And this will be in the packet, so some of the gaps I left, you have. Thanks. Mr. Bottom, any reports? Just uh, real quickly, uh, I can talk loud enough. Uh, uh, Mrs. Webb and I were at the uh, select board's meeting last Tuesday, Tuesday night and it, we were there to represent regarding, uh, regarding the capital discussion. Uh, a pretty smooth discussion, and I know there'll be some more on that, or you just report out on yes. that. On, on, it was mainly about turf, too, but and how things are moving forward. 
Uh, so that was really all that, that happened there. The other, the other thing I wanted to comment on that I stayed, we stayed around for, and they had their budget discussions and, uh, you know, the one of the things that we had a little bit of a conversation about was uh, his, historically we've always been very conservative with uh, projecting health care costs and uh, last year uh, we used 10 percent 10 percent and change in the budget and it ended up coming in much lower than that I think two uh, percent or three percent or something so uh, one of the things I was happy to see, and I think we're gonna talk about a little bit in the budget tonight, is uh, we're projecting this year for, for FY21 something that's more com commensurate with recent history, and that's, uh, I believe, 4%? I think or, so. Yeah, yeah. Ten, for, so, you know, I think that, and we said, I said it that night, and, and I, I understood all the reasons why we We've done what we've done, but there was a lot of angst last year in the budget process and, and discussions that, you know, maybe uh, didn't have to happen if we were a little more aggressive. Uh, mm -hmm. So I like the fact that we're looking at something that's a little more commensurate with where we've been. So. Thank you. And I don't report I did just want to acknowledge um, just in our consent agenda we what we accepted there was a little over ten thousand dollars of um, donations for a variety of extracurricular environmental and academic programs so I just wanted to acknowledge that the people can see who that all is in our packet um, so our agenda this evening our first um, item of old business is the late start uh, committee continued discussion and vote we have a quarterly personnel update, a quarterly budget update, and then a, a continuation of the superintendent's goals with a revision um, that we'll vote on. And then we have the 2020 pre-budget um, presentation. So it is actually a pretty um, considerable agenda for December 20th, but uh, we're gonna work to see um, if we can be efficient with our time. So right now, um, we will start with the late start uh, working group. Hold on, while you guys are getting ready, Mr. Robinson has one additional report. So yeah, one, one thing I just wanted to mention, uh, I did, I was not able to attend, but uh, our hockey team last night uh, uh, record, recognized Nelson Burbank and let him uh, drop the first puck and you know for a wonderful man that does and continues to do so much for this community that was uh, nice of the team to do that so uh, I was I was gonna try to go I know that the town manager was there and some people so mm -hmm. it was a nice nice thing to do we have assistant superintendent Kelly and our high school principal Ms. Boynton yeah, hello everyone. Um, we're not gonna go through the, the former slideshow. Uh, I know um, you have it. This is uh, just an addendum to um, our presentation two weeks ago. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we have unpacked since that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll let Mrs. Boynton start. Uh, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so why move RMHS to a later start? Um, it does, as research shows, uh, align to teen circadian rhythms uh, to create the capacity for increased sleep. Um, we will become uh, more in line with peer communities. Five of our Middlesex communities have already moved uh, and two, two are currently evaluating for the 2019-2020 later start time. So it brings us in alignment with the rest of the Middlesex, um, the Middlesex League. Um, we anticipate an improved attendance and reduction in tardiness uh, for our own Reading students as well as our students from Boston through the METCO program. Um, studies have shown that there's improved academic performance, executive functioning, working memory, and creativity with a later start time as students get more sleep. Um, we will provide an increased opportunity for students to have breakfast either at home um, with the ability to get up and have a more leisurely start to the day um, and 
and also provide breakfast here at school. Um, it, studies show that a decrease or a, a later start decreases the vulnerability to stress uh, as well as depression, and it reduces the risk uh, for sports-related injuries by enabling student athletes to get closer to eight hours of sleep, which is, is essential for the body to rejuvenate. So where we are with our process is that uh, our committee met this week and we reviewed all of the feedback and questions. Thank you to our tri-chair, Mrs. Williams, hi, Lena, um, who took careful notes and we really did have lots of conversation about um, many of the things that were brought up, uh, as well as the correspondence that we've received from community members and questions that we've received. Um, we're very clear that the research is uh, on our side as far as late start changes really do have a positive positive impact for high school students in particular. Um, but there, there is definitely one piece of the puzzle that we're still looking at addressing, and we realize that there are cha challenges and opportunities uh, with any, any change, but especially in our change of time. Uh, traffic and police presence for Birch Meadow, um, and the whole RMHS traffic, whoops, sorry, RMHS traffic uh, situation, certainly that's a conversation that we're, we've had and we're, we're continue to have practice and rehearsals and extracurricular activities um, we have really made a commitment not to just add an hour on you know that everything gets banked out an hour the whole point is to try to compact things as best as we can especially with practice times we realize that uh, tournaments and competitions in, in all of our arts and athletics sometimes uh, go beyond certain times but we're gonna really take a look at that and really looking at before school activities we don't want to just say all right we're gonna just start everything earlier um, because then that we really want kids to, to get that extra hour of sleep. We realize that there are some concerns around the rise preschool, especially at the high school, um, having, you know, at 8.30 start time, which is their current start time, that that definitely, that overlap is, is an area of concern. We realize that from the beginning. Um, we also, the conversation about homework at the high school is one that that genie is out of the bottle, and Ms. Boynton and I are very aware of that um, and the high school staff is as well um, we have very hard-working well-serving staff that want to prepare our kids for the next stages we know that um, but they're only 24 hours in a day so we're we're gonna really be looking at that that came out over and over again in the 1500 surveys that we did collect from the community that parents uh, and community members are, are really alarmed with the amount of homework that some of our high schools are, are having and then the other conversation that just comes up over and over and over again is student student screen time, and, and frankly, adult screen time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a national epidemic in, in some ways, um, and we are really concerned about it as educators. Um, the high school students, some of them, by the time they get to us, they, their screen time is sort of already a habit. Um, we're really excited about Parent University, which we're in the process of planning, and we're really looking at starting the conversation with families much younger. Mrs. Williams is working hard on that committee with us uh, to look at the things like wait to eight, which is eighth grade before cell phones, um, and really starting to really educate families that like we can really wait on this till um, habits are a little bit more malleable in high school if we don't have five or six or seven years of screen time behind us. So we're really looking at that, um, but we are concerned about the blue light time and its influence on neurological um, sleep patterns, anxiety, all of it. Um, and it's something that as a district we're definitely uh, eager to, uh, to help with that. Um, we also started a website. I know I mentioned this at the last time. I've included it here. I will have um, Dr. Dari send it out in his next journey uh, with a link. We are starting to populate that with tabs on some of the information that was in the PowerPoint, links to all our research, uh, links to recent research. I have a TED Talk up there. So we're going to continue to populate that so that folks have lots of information around that. Uh, so interestingly enough, uh, just um, as recent as December 12th, a new study came out uh, f from the Seattle School District. They changed their start time from 7.50 to 8.45 a number of years ago. Uh, this was in the New York Times, and that um, is the study of the website. 
Yes. So this uh, this link is up on our, on the website uh, as well, and demonstrated throughout the Seattle School District, which is a large school district, that students sleep on average changed from six hours and 50 minutes per night to seven hours and 24 minutes, an increase um, that is beneficial. 4.5 percent increase in grades was seen, and there was an increase in punctuality and attendance. And so this study was sort of more longitudinal. It's been several 2016. 2016, um, and so they've seen results uh, over the last couple of years. So it's pretty compelling research. And we have the links on the website to both the New York Times article as well as the research, which is from Science Mag, um, that was st stated in this just hot off the presses research. So looking at the next steps, here are our recommendations. Uh, we, we are recommending still to change the um, start time of the high school from 7.30 to 8.30, adding an extra hour. Currently, I think as you know, we end at 2.11. Um, Kate and I, along with our awesome uh, central office staff, Mrs. Engelson and uh, Mr. S over here, uh, Chris helped really go through the fine tooth comb of our schedule, looking for every single minute of every single day and making sure that we met the state requirements on time and learning, which we do and we did. So we felt confident that we could um, take, I think, a minute or two minutes off of some of the periods. It actually makes for a more consistent schedule. Our periods will run, um, what is it, 57 minutes? 57 minutes. Um, in some right now are 58, some are 59. Our first period, um, we do have a five minute. It's 62 minutes right now. Yeah. So it'll be 60 minutes. So we, we actually can kept first period a little longer for announcements, but we didn't add a full five minutes. We felt like we could condense those announcements and uh, hit the ground running. Um, so that's our proposal for the high school. As far as the Rise Preschool, we are going to continue to review that. Uh, we realize we do not want our preschool families um, coming at the same time, dealing with high school drivers in the parking lot. We also don't want parents to be stressed with getting kids to other schools. We're gonna be looking at all of those pieces. Um, um, as you know, RISE now has three campuses. Um, so we are around town and we have adjusted things as we've needed to. Um, we don't anticipate a huge adjustment, but we definitely want to have conversations around what works for families and what works for the 70 students that are here at the high school. So we are looking at maybe an 8 a.m. with a, a earlier in the afternoon uh, dismissal or even an after the high school at 8.45 and that would you know, the same hours, it would just be adjusted. Uh, but we're not recommending any changes right now. We know that we will have to make changes. We will have those discussions. There were other uh, challenges and opportunities that we need to discuss, and as a committee, we, we put these on the table. We are saying that we're not gonna add athletic practices before school. Um, we, we don't typically add additional ones. Um, we do have some caveats around that. We have swim and ice hockey. Those are all contingent on outside side facilities, so we may have to adjust that. Other high schools have to do that. Um, I know when I worked in another neighboring district, uh, we had a swim team meeting at 5.30 a.m. In another at another pool, and that was hard for me to swallow as a principal, but it was literally the only swim time they could get. So we don't, luckily, we're not looking at 5.30. <laughs> uh, Mr. Zay is already working with the Y, and we're gonna really hope that we get some really good time around that, but we can't say that it wouldn't be in the morning. It might have to be in the morning if that's what's available. Um, no club activities to start before 8 a.m. with an 8.30 start time. We're saying if you're participating in a club, maybe some of the teachers might want to meet at 8 a.m., but we're going to ask them not to start meeting earlier than that. Um, extra help will be based on availability. Um, where We want to give teachers, we know that this is a change. This is a change in the schedule for a lot of staff members that have had the same schedule all of their careers for the most part. Um, we want them to have the flexibility of saying when they're available. Some may choose to keep an afternoon help time and some may say, you know what, the mornings work best for me. Um, the library and the cafeteria, we plan on opening at eight with supervision um, and we are hoping to have a vibrant breakfast crowd, which we have not really had. So um, I know Mrs. Morello and the, and the folks in the kitchen would be thrilled to have lots of breakfast friends. Um, practices and rehearsals are not gonna end later than what they're ending now. 
Um, we also not gonna add an hour to practice or rehearsals to compensate. So that will be a change. There will be some folks that if they started at three and ended at seven, you know, saying to them, well, we don't want you to add an extra hour. We're gonna have to be really efficient with our time. Um, and also Medco, special ed, and fee-based transportation times will change to a later time. We're gonna work with all of those companies, the bus companies. Um, I know, you know, Sharon and I have already started the conversation around that with special ed. Um, Jason and I have had many conversations, and I know he's here tonight if anyone has any questions. Um, and we will work with the bus companies to facilitate any changes. Yep. So as Chris mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation, some of the conversations that we have to have uh, as a school involve homework and just generally involve our, our schedule as a whole. So I'd like to uh, form a homework review committee to discuss homework and develop some guidelines uh, around uh, homework amounts, um, looking at consistency uh, around homework. Um, it's an important discussion to have because the research is very clear that um, with, with a later start time and a later end time, smooshing um, the lots of homework that students have into that shorter amount of time is not uh, effective. So it's a, a conversation that we have to have as a school community. Um, I'd also like to convene a scheduling committee to look at and consider other changes of uh, the RMHS schedule, which, which has not been changed in a number of years uh, for potentially the 2020-21 school year um, or the 2021-22 school year. So take a look at our schedule as a whole. I know the Reading Police, our partners here, and uh, Deputy Chief Clark is here to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, we'll continue to monitor traffic traffic patterns in the Birch Meadow Drive area, um, and we'll have a significant presence to start the school year, uh, as they usually do, um, and, and, and naturally do. If necessary, we'll adjust traffic patterns to accommodate those changes. So it's we'll be looking at those um, traffic patterns as the school year begins. Um, police will work with the superintendent to communicate suggested traffic routes to Birch Meadow Elementary, as well as RMHS. We'll work with the Recreation Department, facilities, and other outside agencies to help with field and building scheduling. Tom Zaya is on that um, process right now uh, and planning for, uh, for the fall. And the Reading Public Schools will develop ways to educate parents and students on the impact of screen time on sleep patterns and suggestions for change. Parent University is just one example of that. And we'll be working with the RTA on any areas that may impact staff. Are uh, there questions? Yep. Um, um. <coughs> Is that all right? Yeah, I'm gonna take questions just so people know. We'll take some questions from the committee um, and uh, su Assistant Superintendent Kelly and, uh, and other members of the team may answer them. And then we'll also take uh, questions by just, I'll acknowledge people based on hands being raised when we've got some of the questions that the committee has answered. So Mr. Robbins. Thank you for this update. So I'm, I'm obvious, I've been sold on the, the, uh, the educational aspect of all of this. And why, you know, overwhelming reasons why, to me, uh, this is just down to lo logistics and communication, mm -hmm. uh, and we got to get that right. Uh, and I look at, at, you know, making the transition. These are all, uh, all great things, things I've heard about, and things that uh, some of my wish were already solved now, uh, but. You know, I don't want to, I guess as, as myself, as a committee member, I want to, if we move forward with this and when we hit the ground running, I want to see that all of these things have been addressed and, and if there's something we can't, we come back and talk about it. We don't just let our egos get in the way and because there's a vote that says we're doing it, we just have to do it. You know, if there's something that's not going to work, whether it be traffic or something, we got to get back together and talk about it. Uh, we don't want to uh, have that be a problem down the road. Uh, one of the questions I had on the uh, on the bullet points was the uh, the practices and rehearsals won't go an hour later, or hour, or won't we won't add an hour to that at the I guess on the back end. But I guess. I do, my only concern about that is for our athletes or, or uh, band and extracurriculars to have a good experience and for the, I think the coaches or, or advisors to prepare them, 
they put together a practice plan or whatever uh, a plan when they go to go to that. So, so can I uh, we can I make sure they have the time to be able to put their best foot forward and the kids have a good experience with it. So Mr. Zaya might have more to add, but I will say at the committee we talked a little bit about that. I think the way we thought of this is um, we still want them to have a full practice, right? Um, what we're saying is if if you normally end it at nine, it's not gonna end at 10. If I mean, most of our practices are far earlier in the day. So when we say we're not gonna end later, we mean like we're not gonna build into the night. So I think, you know, we're not gonna say you had a two hour practice, now you have a one hour practice. I, I think that's the way we communicated. Do you have more to add to than yes, that, Tom? We're looking at the way we do things. Uh, it may be moving to different fields, maybe sharing some fields. Yeah, no, I think it's, I, I, I like it for, the, for mm -hmm. the other reason, which is the, the, the youth that want to yeah. use the fields or whatever, and that solves that mm -hmm. problem because they're not getting starting later cause, uh, because, but I just wanted to make sure that you know the uh, that you know if you as you said if you have to use different fields because I think that you know the kids have to have a good experience and the, and the only way the coaches are going to be able to do that is if they have the time you know so that's and again, we're committed that comes to that too back down to the logistics yep mm -hmm. and communication we just got we got to have it ready to go when we do this we can't you know have stuff dragging into the if we do it in the fall, right? You know, still ironing out we kinks. Everything has to be ready to go, in my opinion. So one of the things that we discussed as a committee, um, based on tonight's um, vote, if this is passed tonight, or even if it isn't passed tonight, we are planning to continue to meet as a as a team to talk about the impact because we're going to have to meet regularly to update folks. We'll be continuing to update through communications through the district as well as on the website. So we, you know, we can certainly update you all regularly. But we are committed to this. We realize that there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle, and we have to start unpacking them. Some of them are spring discussions anyway. The scheduling piece that Mr. Zay is working on this happens around this time of year anyway. Way. But now, he ha if if this vote happens tonight, he has the information to know this is what our schedule looks like. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Webb, uh, just to just to add to that, um, we will be having this as a regular agenda item in the spring oh, for good. the committee. Yeah. yeah. So that we can keep you updated. Yeah, I think starting in like I'm um, just looking at the meetings in March, starting in March. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Just, did did Mr. Zay? Did you have anything else to add, or were you all? Okay. Um, Dr. Doxer. I'm, I'm wondering, thank you very much. There's been a lot of care made, put into this um, proposal. Um, the meetings of the Late Start Committee, are those open meetings? I think they are because they have to be open meeting no. law. No, they're not. No, they're not public meetings. That's a working group, but it's not it's a working group. subject to open meeting law. The um, uh, superintendent. Kelly yeah, we, we haven't advertised them. I mean, they're certainly not closed, yeah, <laughs> um, but we haven't posted them. It's a working group. Um, frankly, we, we've been doing some work virtually. We, we've been working, you know, on-site and off-site. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, a, as, as we continue to develop, we'll continue to populate that website so that information is out there as we have it. And, and people have access to that and certainly have felt um, free to give you a call. And I they know have a lot of people have oh, yeah. called yeah, um, Principal like Boynton <laughs> or, uh, yeah. or I don't know if people have called Linda Williams or yeah. not, probably. Yeah. And uh, most of, and any of the emails that have come to the committee, the school committee, have also been distributed to the um, chairs. Start Working Group to the, yeah. the three co-chairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other committee comments? Mr. Bobbin. Thank you for coming back and responding to our comments and others uh, since our last meeting. Safety, my mm -hmm. first set of questions. So I'd like to learn more about the discussions you had with the police department. It looks like we have a member of our, our police force with us. I don't know if he or one of you can speak to the specific considerations that you discussed and how, how the police department can partner with the schools to ensure the safety Deb of students. Debbie, can you come to the mic? Thank I'd you. I'd appreciate any, anything you could provide us. <laughs> 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 
Thank you. So we do work hand in hand with the schools, the superintendent on a regular basis with any concerns. For years we've had a traffic uh, plan in place for beginning of school anyway with all the schools. We limit time off from officers being able to take time off the first week of school. We hold officers in the midnight take shift over to add extra officers onto the streets and support services, the community service officer, the traffic enforcement officer, the detectives. We put everybody out in the street. So we actually almost in essence, almost triple the amount of police officers are on the street and flood the areas of the schools the first couple weeks anyway. Uh, parents going to new schools, switching from Wood End to Coolidge, Coolidge <coughs> to High School. That way people get to learn the traffic patterns, and we, we do, we're thoroughly out there. Our job isn't to be pulling people over, writing tickets. Our job is to educate, keep, the keep it safe, and educate people on the best traffic patterns. We've been in touch with the superintendent of schools about this. We've discussed this plan with our traffic and safety officer. That's what his job is, on top of being in charge of the crossing guards, is construction projects and the school projects. We've worked with the SROs and we have a plan in place um, and we're going to work with it <coughs> and we can tweak as necessary. If something's not working on day one, we will meet, we'll change it. Hopefully we fix it on day two. If it's not fixed on day two, we will meet again, discuss it, and come up with best practices for day three. I'm confident though that it's going to go smooth. And I actually, considering I'm down that my kids go in that school district anyway, and I'm down there on a regular basis every morning, I actually think it's going to be easier when you take Coolidge out of the equation. I really do, because when you separate the high school from Birch Meadow, and Coolidge is already in session, in my opinion, based on because I'm down there every morning anyway, I think it's going to actually be easier. I think we're going to have uh, less traffic congestion during that during those times. Just a personal opinion of mine from observations. But like I said, any concerns we have with traffic, we'll take. We'll take everything in. If Dr. Doherty gets them, he will share them with us. We'll share with any concerns we got. We'll meet with the traffic and safety officer, meet with the school resource officers, the principals, wherever you need to, the chief and I, and we will make sure that everything's going as smooth as possible. I was going to raise my hand for myself. <laughs> um, so I, I think just in, in line with this, one of the things that I think is important was here was that um, to communicate sort of the suggested traffic routes. So I think that that, you know, that's really important as you point out, you get new parents, um, parents that are shifting, you know, you're now doing Birch Meadow and, and Coolidge and make sure that we are providing people with, you know, the best streets and ways to access the different schools. Um, from, you know, different neighborhoods or... Yes, one of the suggestions we had is anybody going to Birch Meadow, we asked them to focus on Forest Street, come in the backside down Arthur B. Lord. High school students try to mo mostly focus coming off of Main Street and coming right off of Main Street. Mm -hmm. We can suggest those. That's unenforceable. We can't force it. Right. Just keep that in mind. But we will educate through um, social media with the school's newsletter, Code Red, which is the town's um, system, and we'll do our best practices. The, we have the message boards. We can put the message boards up reminding people, so making suggestions, and like I said, we will work hand in hand to make sure it goes as smooth as possible. Great. Any other questions for the officer? Thank you very much for no. coming. Look, any, anytime, like I said, this, this is important. We're going to show you that we are committed with the school to make this work as if whatever the school needs, we're here to help out. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. You're welcome. I have other questions, but okay. if there's any for the, for the police officer, is that there any other questions? Unless anyone, if anyone specifically has a safety question, while uh, Deputy Clark is there, anybody in the audience? Oh, great. Thank you, Mr. Bob. I separate questions. Separate okay. Issue going back to school. Okay. But thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was surprised that the the rise time is still under review, and when do when do parents have to enroll their students for next year and what time will be used at that time? so uh, the registration packets have gone out um, right now they don't include the exact start times i know that um, last year there were some adjustments on the other satellite campuses uh, we are fully planning to let people know as soon as we've decided we john and i uh, superintendent Darty and i have started conversations with the rise director uh, we had already before this um, and we're going to look at all possible options and, and talk to folks around that. Um, whether we should start earlier, whether we should start after schools in session, we know that it can't be exactly at the same time. When, when will that be decided? Um, I, I, Dr. Darty, do we have a timeline on when we're going to decide that with RISE? I would say within the next month. Yeah. yeah. Sooner rather than later. Right, but the letter that went out didn't, it stated the The, the letter doesn't have times, it has the have. length of the, the school school day for them, because uh, preschool students can sign up for different programs. Right. 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 
No, I'm sorry. Mr. Bond. Yeah. Are, are there, is there parent participation in those discussions with parents? Well, they haven't been yet, but we will definitely be seeking input from the RISE parents. Mm -hmm. oh, Dr. Dart did have some discussions. What's so that? I, I think yeah. bringing all the stakeholders together yep. and, and yep. getting right is important. And to Chuck's point, like if, if whatever we initially decide collectively, right, as, as yep. in this room, it, it isn't best after you start. I mean, do what's best for the for the school and the kids, right? So don't feel that because you know, come back to us as a committee and, and talk to us if, if that's appropriate. There are going to be unanticipated things that are even maybe beyond this. Right. Uh, as a committee, we're really committed to getting this right. We want to make this transition as smooth as possible. I think. Um, to Mr. Bobbin's point, just uh, there was a discussion actually prior to the meeting start, starting with Dr. Darty that the um, this is generally the school committee does not set the uh, start times um, or make adjustments to the start times. Those are operational, like right. sort of yeah. within that five, 10, 15 minute window, and that's been done. I don't know, I've been on 14 years, so over those 14 years anyways. So, but this, the changing from, you know, 7.30 know. to 8.30 yeah. is a big shift. So the committee is taking a vote on that, and obviously it comes to that level, but as Mr. Bobbin just pointed out, if there's some tweaking that's necessary as a result of that, as a result of, you know, working mm -hmm. all these pieces, that's not something that has to come back to the committee. Yep. But, but we, but we but would we certainly be updating the committee right. on anything that changes like that. Right, so we'll definitely. Um, are there... Can we start to take some, um, Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson. For Dr. Yes. John. So what any, if any, budget implications does this have, like, uh, for a compensation? <coughs> uh, if we're bringing uh, cafeterias coming in when they would come in, but they're probably staying later, right? Mm, uh, no. no. No, actually, okay. that's not the case. I actually had this conversation with Krista Morello today. Um, and it will not impact um, increasing the hours of the cafeteria employees. So is this this whole thing cost neutral or at, at this point? Yes, I mean, we, we will sit down with the RTA for some, any of logistical items that are currently in the contract that we may need to do a side letter on, but none of them will be a, have a financial impact. So for, I'll give you a quick example. One of the things that could be shifted um, is currently the contract talks about staff meetings being after school only. We could have a side letter with the, uh, the RTA that, that would allow staff meetings to happen before school. So that, but that doesn't have a financial impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Bobby. Oh, I have. Dr. Dox, sorry. Thank you. Um, I had heard, and you mentioned that there's um, the bus transportation, and that includes the regular bus um, buses that mm -hmm. children have to have special needs, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But I understand there's also a fee, um, a bus mm -hmm. that people can sign up for and mm -hmm. pay a fee. Can you talk just a little bit about that, like process when people would sign up for it, how they do that, are there restrictions around signing up for that? So I, since I haven't been here in the spring to handle the registration around that, I do know that uh, we are not fully enrolled with pay f for fee uh, busing, so we have some room to work around that. Um, do we allow people in the spring, I know Linda and John handle that, Is do, do people sign up for the bus in the spring? Yes, they sign up. They sign up. Usually, we send it June. It's June. We send it up. We have very few that are over uh, the 2.0, you know, mile. So, as a district, we don't bus a lot of kids um, because of that. By by regulation, we we don't have to bus anybody after grade six. Six. Yeah. So. If they are not necessarily further away than 2.0, but it would be helpful for them to have that to pay for a bus, is that an option for them, or do they? Well, it depends. It would have to be as capacity fits. I mean, as right now we don't have full buses, so I guess we'll have to see what the registrations look like. Thank you. No, I just want to clarify. We we have one bus for the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, we will not be able to go beyond that one right. bus. So the Metco buses are leaving at a later time. Did I read that right? Right. So do you want to talk to yeah. that, Jason, about that? Yeah. Wanna? 
is Jason Cross, our Medco director. Thanks, Jason. Oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, the Baco, Medco buses would just have a uh, bus schedule adjusted. It's just like uh, during snowstorms or if there's a later start time, I already have our delayed bus schedules put together that parents are already, already mindful of. So I would send that out, go with that schedule. It'll probably be uh, less than an hour delay by my schedule because my middle schoolers would still need to get to school on time. So my high schoolers would get to school as they do now earlier than, than most, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you talk about just any other impact on the Medco program from shifting, not just the start time, but also the end of the day a little later for high school? Uh, so the end of the day would pretty much be the same. My bus picks them up around 252, 255 right now, so it wouldn't be that big a difference for them in that regard, and they'd also have more time to connect with teachers after school if they took advantage of that, as you know, some students aren't keen on doing. Um, but um, yeah, so they would they would be fine um, after school. Um, it was the uh, yeah they would they would um, they would, it would be pretty much the same. The yeah. afternoon would be the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, early morning, I'm sure they'd appreciate the you know, 15 m more minutes of sleep that they get, but it's it's not, it doesn't impact them as much because they still have to get up to get this, to get dressed, to get to the bus stop, and then deal with traffic on 93. So they still have to be out of Boston at a decent time to avoid an increase in traffic, so, yeah. And since we share a bus with the middle school students, Right now, they come early to get to high school first, and then the middle school is there. So it'll be a reverse. Very early, it'll be reverse. Yeah. So they'll go to the middle school first, drop them off mm -hmm. for their arrival. So it really, in essence, builds about a 15 or 20 minute window that doesn't exist right now, right. which helps with traffic too, because sometimes they come late because of the traffic, yeah. um, if it's really bad on 93. Right. Mr. Ross? So the, so the, the, first bus pickup would be reflective now of, in Boston, would be re reflective of the middle school start time as opposed to right. the high So yeah. they are, all of the kids are getting a little more time to sleep. 15 yeah. or 20 minutes. Yeah, 15. So my first bus stop right now is 5.45 a.m. Mm -hmm. So it probably, so yeah, really yeah. Wow. Yes, that is true. Um, so they they probably we probably go up to like six six oh five maybe. It's not it's not gonna make it's not gonna be that much of a difference because I still have to plan out what traffic is gonna look like at that time. And I'm I'm in the traffic, so I know how traffic flows. And then my bus drivers all live in. Molden, and they know how the traffic flows, so they have a good idea of traffic patterns. They know where to get off at and routes to take. But um, yeah, we would make that adjustment to the schedule, and then um, go from there. Okay. Any other questions? Did you have another question for Jason? Oh. Um, Thank you. Jason. Any questions from anyone Thank in the you, audience? Jason. Anyone? Um, Wanted to make a comment? Yeah, yeah. I, if you, people can raise their hand, yep. Excuse me. Excuse me. Wait. Okay. Yep. You you need to come up. I'm sorry. You need to come up to the microphone and identify yourself. And thank you. Hi, Maureen Hurley. Um, just so I can make sure I'm clear. So with, even though they're swapping right now, middle school first bell 740, high school starts at 730. So for them, it's really like a 10 minute, right? If they still have to get there. So it's about 10 minutes that the high schoolers might have of extra time in the morning to themselves or to sleep in or whatever it might be. Right in summary? Okay. Well, Thank they, you. They he, come he, before 730. They're here before. 
they don't like walk in the door at 7 30. right right but it, but with if they were at 8 30 they're not getting they would because they're still transporting with the middle schoolers yeah. it would be about 10 extra minutes that they would have in the morning whether they're on the bus or sitting at school I think 10 minutes a later start for them leaving home Leaving home. Okay. Yep. You said that Thank you. You said you would sh you would be shifting the pickup from 5:45 to 6 or 6:05. Six yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's it's a, it's actually possible that my bus route is possible that it stays exactly the same because they would go to the middle school first and then drop to the high school. So it's possible that 545 could still remain that or I could look to shift my middle schoolers to my elementary bus and they would be on the elementary bus. And so I'm, I'm still figuring the best way, but it could actually remain the same. Um, and they, minutes. yeah, because it, again, they would, you would just be going to the middle school first and then dropping them to the high school. So we could end up with our bus route being exactly the same. And the high schoolers are here early there, you know, they're here at 750 with some time before classes actually start for them. And most of the time, Ms. Burke is here in there in the library and she saw. Yeah, so that's possible as well. Can it, oh, oh my gosh, how many students do we have at each of the levels? Uh, at each level, we have 67 total, oh. and we have uh, 39 elementary. Uh, we have six, about 18 middle, and then 15 at the high school, I believe. That's how the numbers break up. Thank you. So. Thank you. There, there were a couple other hands raised. Autumn. Thanks, yeah. Jason. Thank, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Hi. Um, I have just some remarks here for the school committee and for the public, I suppose. Um, so yes, I am Autumn Hendrickson. Um, I am a junior at RMHS, and I am here to speak once again on the issue of the proposed late start for RMHS next school year, as I understand that you plan to vote on this tonight. So I you know, heard a lot, many seem to believe that this is a done deal, um, and I sincerely hope that you can find it within yourselves to truly hear what I'm saying and not just sort of, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, so although I said this exact thing the last time I spoke here, I wanna say it again. Um, according to the Reading Public Schools 2017 student survey, a mere 6% of RMHS students cited lack of sleep as their primary negative stressor. The largest percentage belonged to none other than schoolwork at 36%, followed shortly by being too busy at 24%. Um, enrollment data for Reading Memorial High School provided by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education says that during last, the last school year, there were 1,235 students at RMHS. So using that information, I can tell you that 444 of your RMHS students cited schoolwork as causing them the most stress. And just under 300, I believe it was 296 or so students cited being too busy as their primary stressor, while 74, 74 out of 1,235 of your RMHS students cited that lack of sleep was their main source of stress. A late start is quite clearly not what the student body is asking for, wants, or seems to need at this time. Not only has almost every student I've talked to about this been very much against it, but all of them have presented the same concern, schoolwork and homework. 
And for many of my peers, high school was when their mental health issues started to rear their ugly heads. As someone with ADHD and anxiety, I never should have made it as far as I have, to be quite honest. But the only reason I have is because I have quite literally been forced to neglect my mental health in order to succeed in school. And no, sleep can't make that go away. It can't make me not have anxiety. It can't make me not have ADHD. For kids who might have, you know, increased stress levels because they're not getting sleep, this will help. But for kids like me, who have had anxiety since like seventh grade, who have had ADHD since we were in fifth grade, it's not gonna make it go away. Uh, many of my peers, and myself included, often become our friends' therapists. I've comforted at least five kids, three of whom I had never met before, as they sobbed their eyes out in the middle of guidance, usually over something related to a class, and proceeded to have some sort of breakdown. And no, sleep can't fix that. Sleep might help with all of these things I've laid out for you, but it's not the root of the problem. God knows that history has shown you will have no hope of solving a problem if you only acknowledge one branch of it. Schoolwork is the trunk, and you cannot cut down a tree by only cutting its branches. I understand that there's been a proposal to raise the issue of homework within the school community if the late start does pass, but I have quite a few concerns about this. For one thing, it would be very easy to simply say, oh, sorry, we really can't make a, a big change to this for X or Y reason. Once the late start is already in place, the people who might be willing to support this with the understanding that the schoolwork will be addressed will be left feeling outraged. Uh, and as a student, I've seen this happen before, and, and it doesn't usually go well. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that homework needs to be addressed before passing this. This is so important and so integral to this. This needs to, like, there needs to be a solid, guaranteed, like, oh, we have information for you on what we want to do before we change this because that's really, change this and then the homework doesn't actually, the changes that they make to homework don't actually work. It's like <coughs> nothing's happening. And two, make sure that students, not just model students, are working with staff to do this. I understand that at, some, at, at this point, some of you might be thinking, whatever happened to rigor in education? Do you just want us to let kids sit around all day? No one is saying that. No one is saying there shouldn't be any homework. No one is saying that there shouldn't be any challenging work. What I'm trying to say is that my peers are not just numbers. The way this impacts our lives as individuals cannot possibly be justified by a series of sti scientific studies on the benefits of a later start and more sleep. Perhaps if you spent a week living as an RMHS student, you might understand just how overwhelmed and overworked we are. It is not enough to say, look at these studies and look at what other communities have said about this. You cannot observe us from behind a looking glass. I am challenging each and every one of you to shadow one of your students for a day. See the world from our eyes, then you might understand why many of us know, know that this will not benefit us. Tonight is the future of my peers, myself, and my teachers hanging in the balance. I, I want to make one thing abundantly clear to everyone here. If you really care about your community and really do want to do what is best for them, do not allow this to change until homework has been thoroughly addressed, and I mean really addressed. As I said, you cannot even begin to solve a problem if you only choose to acknowledge one branch of it. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. Um, is there anyone else who would like to make a comment? Yep. Hi. Um, my name is Marcy Mafio. I have three kids in Browning Public Schools. And I was curious, I watched last week, and I was curious if you considered other times. Was 8.30 the only time you considered, or did you consider something before 8.30, 8.15, I didn't know. 
With so, uh, thank you. Uh, we actually did consider uh, other times. Um, some of the communities in Middlesex League that were early adopters that changed their time a few years ago looked at 8 and 8.15. Um, the more recent adopters looked at 8.30. Um, the research is actually, every time the research comes out, they talk about more and more about more sleep. They're really recommending the um, American Medical Association, the Pediatrics Association, they're actually recommending 8.45 as a minimum start time. We really felt like we couldn't even consider that. Uh, one of our neighboring districts went to 8.35 start time. We felt like 8.30 and looking at our end time to try to shave off a few minutes could work for us. We really didn't, at 8 o'clock for us, if we're going to make this kind of huge shift, we felt like the benefits of a half hour sleep, if that happened, they, we didn't want to make that recommendation. So that's really where we came up with the 8.30. And then just a follow-up question. Yeah. So elementary starts at 8.15. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone in elementary and in high school, that's a little bit close compared to sort of now. They're a little bit more spread out now, I feel like. Yeah, so they started. The first bell is at 8.15, right? Right. So, right. so you're on the blacktop I mean, at 8.15. You know, we'll definitely have to look at that as yeah. far as traffic patterns. The other thing is the high school will be opened at 8. Uh, we will have supervision at 8 o'clock, so that's part of what we were thinking, that if we don't want folks to feel stressed getting around town, uh, ideally without traffic, and we know Reading has a lot of traffic now, there is no school that should take more than 10 minutes to get around town, but we know that that's not always the case. So, th yeah, so... Th so the school, that's part of why we're opening the school at 8, um, knowing that breakfast, library, that they'll be open. So um, if folks need to drop kids off and then get to the elementary schools, they should have time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who have any? Yeah. Um, I would take, Mr. Corey, actually, you said a quick question. I just want to make sure I get everyone. So do you want to go first? Or? You can go. You're ahead, right. Maura. Okay. Um, Maureen Hurley again. Um, I, I emailed the committee last night as well. I feel like, I don't think anyone's questioning the studies we have here. It's, it's not a matter of that, but I think one element that I'm missing from all this is not just what works for the kids, but we have to think about what works for the families here too. You know, the studies don't take real life into consideration. Um, most people's jobs start before 8.30. Most jobs don't even start at 9 o'clock anymore that I'm aware of. Um, you know, talking about uh, getting around town, I mean, I, I, were, I live in an area, my kids went to kill them. I was over two miles away because when they built Wood End, that's what they decided, that that whole side of Reading would be going up there. I can't imagine people who are in that position that have to get to kill him to Parker and then over to the high school. I mean, 129 is a disaster. So I mean, these are the things that I'm not hearing that these are the real life situations. People who have adapted their childcare, they're made, they've made work decisions, their commuting decisions based on a 7.30 start. I think the further we deviate from a 7.30 start, the more strain it is putting on the entire community. I think that 8.15 would be ideal. I know some towns are doing that. However, because of, again, another unique thing in Reading, where we have schools that are bunched together, Coolidge, Birch Meadow High School, that that might not be an option. However, the one thing I keep looking at in all this is that 8 a.m. is a fine time between middle school and elementary school start that's been ignored. And I don't think this is a situation where it's go big or go home. I think we need to approach this very carefully and do what works for the families. I know my kid benefited greatly from an 8 a.m. late start every Tuesday last year. She always had a late practice. She was at practice till I think 9 or 9.30 every Monday night last year. Those Tuesdays were a savior. So it may not seem like that extra half an hour is worth it, but at the same time, it does make a difference. Sometimes an improvement has to trump an idealism, maybe. Um, and finally, I think we're turning the world upside down 
down, if now we're having to move rise times, if we go for that eight o'clock or 8.05 or whatever it is, then we don't have to touch rise. We can have all these schools slotted so people have time to get around, but we can still get on with our lives without waiting till nine o'clock or thinking, how are we gonna get there? The busing's a huge issue. People drive their kids to school. We don't have, how are these high schoolers getting to school if parents are already leaving for work? There's a lot here and that's fine. We can say that we're gonna look at things, we're gonna look at things, but I don't see how a vote could go for this right now with all these question marks lingering still out there. We need more concrete answers. Thank you. Is there another comment? Uh, there was somebody else from the audience, but we missed. No, just a quick question. Isn't the high school open at 8 o'clock under this plan? Yes. yes. But the rise kids are arriving at 7.50. No, um, no, that's Coolidge. No, I'm sorry. Coolidge 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 Coolidge. I'm sorry. I meant Metco kids. I'm sorry. Yes. So we, well, we have I mean, to be open when they arrive, right? They're here at 7.50, obviously. Okay, but, but that school's going to be open at least at right. 8 o'clock, right? Yes. So yeah, people can come at 8 and have a nice breakfast? Yep. Yes. yes. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mr. Corey. Oh, no. So like Autumn, I also spoke at the last um, committee meeting about this topic, and I, um, I, I wanna both echo some of the things that Autumn has said, and also advocate for you guys voting for this change. Um, so I think uh, Autumn raised some good points about homework, and I'm glad that you guys are looking at this. Um, it was, seven years ago, eight years ago, when we had the Race to Nowhere mm -hmm. movie, big mm -hmm. deal, um, right, about the level of homework and the level of stress that it's causing our kids and the, the impact on the mental health of our kids. And a, as far as I can see, we haven't really done anything with that. Um, so I'm glad that you're looking at that and, and you wanna do something with that because I agree that is a piece of what's causing the stress for our kids. I have a high schooler, she's a senior, whatever you guys decide is not gonna affect her. I also have an eighth grader who doesn't go to the Reading Public Schools. So again, whatever you decide is not gonna affect my kids, but the last time that I spoke, I said that I've been paying attention to this issue for probably 15 years, and I've been wondering for 10 or 12 years when Reading was gonna actually do something about this and pay attention to this growing body of science that is showing the benefits for our kids. Um, I, somebody on the committee said that it sounds like a lot of the issues are sort of down to communication and logistics, and I agree with that. And there are things that we can change. We can change um, start times, we can change the way that we commute, we can change the way our kids get to school, maybe they ride a bike or walk um, instead of being driven everywhere. Um, we can change uh, you know, the, the bus schedules, we can change traffic patterns, all of those things we can change. The things that we can't change is the biology of our students, right? They have a shifted circadian rhythm. We can't change that. So I think the thing that we can do is design our system or pieces of our system, maybe one piece at a time, and design them to best serve our kids. And so with that in mind, I would strongly advocate to the committee to vote for this change. Not that it's gonna solve every issue, because it won't. But I think we can take a bite and make this change, and then we can take a bite and look at homework, and we can take a bite and look at some of the other things. Mm -hmm. And we're not gonna solve this all at once, but I would encourage us to take a step, mm -hmm. because I've been, as I said, I have a high school senior, I've been watching this for a long time, I've seen you know, Race to Nowhere six or seven years ago, I've seen the conversations about late start at the high school level, you know, they started, I don't know, four years ago or something, and then went silent, um, so uh, take a step, take a step, make it better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Robinson? So uh, I ap appreciate Ms. Hendricks, Ms. Hendrickson's and Mr. Corey's comments and Again, back to the, especially regarding the homework. Uh, and I don't know whether we can tonight, but I would like to put some brackets around. I want uh, deliverables, like when that committee's gonna be set up, and and I'd like to see that, not, not I, I appreciate, you know, maybe do that later, but I'd like to try and see that implemented 
at the same time that if we, if we implement this. So in the, in the fall, uh, whatever that, whatever uh, deliverables come out of that committee. I, I just wanna, I think yep. this, this discussion has happened at the working group and um, you know, one of the things that I personally feel is really important is that as part of that we don't, that we don't go too fast without collecting the information because I do think that we that we need to look at how well our graduates are prepared and, and how they're doing post uh, running high. And the thing that I, I don't want to see is us changing their ability to be successful. My own personal experience with all four of my children was they were just so well prepared. They knew how to do the level of work that was required in college. Now, if we need to make, I'm not saying that um, all the time that they spent was you know, maybe they didn't need to spend all that time. Maybe it should have been in different modalities. But these are things, this is, uh, this is operational stuff that I just think it needs time, so I wanna make sure we get an update. I understand, I'm not suggesting that they come back with a change in homework just because we need to. I'm yeah. saying that I don't wanna wait until the fall to start that. I think we need to start that right away. I can speak to that. Um, so my goal uh, is to convene a homework committee um, in January or February at the very latest to have conversations about how much homework is the right amount of homework, the kind of homework, what's the purpose of homework, um, to ideally um, come up with some recommendations and guidelines by the end of the school year in line with whatever decision that the school committee makes. I think regardless of the, this vote today, homework is an issue to Autumn's point that we have to talk about as a school community. One of the first steps in this direction, and this is something that the high school has done for a number of years, Lynna and I were just talking about this, is that we're bringing back graduates, uh, really it's January 2nd, is that right, Lynna? Uh, and it's a, quite a large pool of graduates. They've done, the, we've done this for uh, quite a number of years, bringing back graduates. They talk to the senior class um, during flex block, and then we are um, also coming in as an administrative team from the superintendent, assistant superintendent, myself, department chair, um, along with Lina to talk really intimately with these graduates. And Lina, how many graduates are coming? 21 graduates, so that's quite a large number, to get their feedback. Um, and we have this uh, information um, kind of longitudinally because it's something that we've been doing as a school for a number of years. So that would be the first step uh, in, in terms of getting information about uh, their preparedness for college and what's their sense as graduates uh, of, of the homework load. Um, so that's, that's a first step. Mr. Bonner. I'd like you to find 51 minutes. 51 minutes. So to respond to Ms. Hendrickson's points, which were excellent, and she's twice spoke to this committee, we're taking 51 minutes away from a student's afternoon. We need to find that time, okay? However you do it, that's for the working groups. It could be a combination of homework, so if you want to, if you want to address it through homework, if hypothetically you have I'm working five classes a night, and you want 51 minutes, that's about 10 minutes per class per night. If you wanna go from four hours of homework to three hours of homework a night, and a little more, that's a significant reduction over the numbers we saw in the bar charts in, in uh, Ms. Kelly's presentation last meeting, right? So take that seriously, call it the Nick Boyden challenge if you want, <laughs> but find 51 minutes to address the concerns that our students have brought to this committee, which I take very seriously. We can't take time out of the day and we can't slow the rotation of the earth around its axis as much as we'd like to. Okay, I just, I totally appreciate you giving them that challenge, but I, I'm gonna push back on it because the, I mean, I think that the committee, this is not something for us to be, I think giving them um, an unsubstantiated target before they even start the process. And I just feel, I feel very strongly, I'm, this is, I try not, I try to leave my agendas at home, but I, my, my children, the other, their friends, all have gone to outstanding colleges. They did homework, they struggled through it. I supported them, we worked it out but they learned how to study hard and they have excelled. And if, if 51 minutes isn't the right number, because it's, I'm assuming a reduction by 51 minutes, that's what you were talking about? 
We're taking 51 minutes out so of the afternoon. So I, I just think we, we can't <laughs> prescribe that. I think we want to see some real rigor to the, uh, the evaluation and rigor to, you know, that, and know that the homework is valuable, and you know whether it's modalities or so. I I I, I don't think we should restrict the, their work. I think setting some goals, to asking them to set goals for themselves that are are um, really going to achieve, still giving our students the level of homework and quality homework they need, but also helping to reduce the stress. Mrs. Borowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I. I have a couple of comments I wanted to make through the evening, but then every time I would go to say it, someone else would make the point better than I would have. So I'm gonna reiterate a couple of things, but I do have a thought about this 51 minutes. Um, Mr. Robinson, when you said logistics and communications, I just agree, that was perfectly stated, and that was exactly what I was thinking. Um, for me, the research and the data on the need for this is very clear and, and backed by the most prestigious groups of experts in the country on the biological fact of adolescence and what it means, and this is what it means. So I'm fully sold on that. Um, but I want to support everything that Mr. Robinson said about logistics communication, getting it right, and looping back with this committee and the public as much as possible. Um, so I agree with that completely. I also wanted to say that um, I was extremely moved by our student speaker tonight. Um, I was extremely moved by everything you said, and I think you made some really important points. Um, but I also agree with the speaker who said that you made some really, really good points, and yet this is also, in my opinion, an important thing to do. It's not one or the other, it's both. We have to do both. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of where I'm at right now. And as far as the 51 minute, uh, that was an interesting discussion between the two of you, and I'm gonna kind of throw out a different approach. Sometimes it isn't the, um, and this is, uh, I used to be high school English teacher stuff, putting on my old, old, old teacher hat. Sometimes it's not the amount of homework, it's how you assign it. So I know of a, I'm very close with a high school teacher that has recently gone to a completely different method of assigning homework. So there's no homework every night in my class, but over the course of this term, you will be expected to do X, Y, and Z, um, and you have to do it on a regular basis, and there's some parameters around it, but you can do it on the weekends. You can do it all on Tuesday night, because Tuesday's your good day, and you can't do it on Thursday. So. You know, maybe it isn't just 51 minutes every afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different approach, which um, actually can encourage independence and can encourage self-management. So those are the kind of conversations I think you will be having, and I'm excited to hear more about. And I agree with Mr. Robinson, too. I, I certainly would like to hear more about this, because I think that the student speaker's points about the mental health of our students were absolutely accurate and very critical. Did you have something else? No, I, I don't think any of us disagree, actually. We're all <laughs> so I, I think Ms. Barraski's point is fantastic. Yes. Like, let's, let's rethink how we, how we um, what we expect of students and how that expectation can be met, both not just in homework, but also in extracurriculars and all that we've talked about. My, my point was a simple one. It's just the afternoon is 51 minutes shorter. Just, that's just a mathematical fact, right? Um, so we need to account for that and not, and not act as if that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. But none of this is, is for the, and that's why I didn't call it the school committee challenge, right? Right. because <laughs> this is not, I mean, I'm just try, trying to yeah. make clear, the only, only comment is my own and not, not the committee's comment, but no, I, I, I agree that we, we absolutely are not the right forum to discuss the, the nitty gritty and find the best answers here. I don't think we are. I think these working groups that you're setting up are, are the right forum. They should be participatory and, and inclusive. And to Mr. Robinson's point, I want an update. I want to hear what that the best brains we have in Reading have to say about how to, what do we do with the missing 51 minutes? They're gone. Mm -hmm. What do we do with it? How are we going to address that? When we we built our lives around having 51 extra minutes after school, we don't have that because we're hoping people will use up to an hour yeah. earlier in the day. And it's nice that you trim nine minutes, right, in that way, you, however you did that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Doctor. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking through this process is um, about the fact that we do have nine months to make this shift, and I'm really glad that we're talking about it now and not later and not making commitments later if we make them now. There's time. I was really heartened um, by your discussion about you want to set up this homework committee in January. I think that this is going to be a catalyst 
for a lot of good change and a lot of good discussion. And that has been important even before we were discussing this. And yeah, I remember about the race to nowhere. It was very powerful and I see it playing out all the time. I think that um, Autumn brought up great points. I think that um, the all of the points that you brought up and, and uh, everybody else also, they all play, they're all integral with each other. And this is a starting point so that we can set our goals. Um, and, and I guess I, I don't think it's around minutes that's the issue. I think it's around um, the quality of the assignments and like Mrs. Borowski said, time management issues and learning how to uh, engage students in skills that will take them through, whether it's college or life challenges, they don't all go to college. But these are all skills that um, students need to learn and the supports they need to have now. So I think this homework committee um, is really important and that the police will be responding and will be there and, and they can change things with recommendations. Um, I think that this nine months is really important because I don't want to see it kick down the road. I think we need to make this change and why not now when we have nine months to implement it and implement it well. And we have amazing educators who also have skin in the game to make this work for them as well. So this gives time to work together to make it work. And I really appreciate your leadership on this. Um, thank you. There were some other hands raised. Um, someone in the back who hasn't spoken, and then Autumn. <clears throat> Excuse me, Diane Nazis. Um, just, I have a question about elementary and middle school. Does this um, model, are, are we gonna try to shift some of those times? Is there any? We're not recommending that. Uh, some districts have, primarily the districts that heavily bus students. They have had to switch elementary to far earlier. Okay. Uh, we're not looking at that model right now. We realize that, uh, you know, as it is, this is a major change. Most of the districts that we spoke to that made an elementary or middle school shift, it was because they share buses. Okay. They, you know, bus 1,500 kids in their district and they had to share the buses. Um, and frankly, the elementary shift was was tough. Moving to a half hour earlier or whatever, really tough for, for families to, to deal with that. So do we have the circadian rhythm for younger kids yeah. as well? Yeah. Is, we is it the same reason. model? Is it it really same? starts kicking in like pubescent, um, which could be some middle schoolers, definitely, okay. uh, but it really hits like in high school. So okay. uh, high school is definitely the preferred, you know, in middle school, we're gonna have to look at elementary, they're actually ready to go early in the morning. Okay. You mm -hmm. know that from having elementary kids. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they're tired, more tired at night. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that post-adolescent pubescent, that whole area, that's when the brain starts shifting. Um, and it's really important for high school. And, and from our own surveys, we've seen by the time kids are seniors at this high school, they're getting very little sleep. Mm -hmm. they're, they're saying it themselves. They're saying, what was it, like five, five hours sleep on average, six hours okay. sleep. It, it's, it's alarming. Okay. So just a couple, <coughs> excuse me, comments from, from my end. Yeah. I do have a high school or one more coming up. Um, we're early risers, so this is kind of a mute point for our family. I do understand that the circadian rhythm and that sort of thing. I feel like going on, Ms. Doxer, I feel like we don't have a lot of time to answer a lot of these questions coming forward. There are a lot of questions here that are not answered, have not really even been um, looked at very much. and. Nine months sounds like a lot, but when you are forming committees and talking and having questions and then inviting um, the public to speak and that sort of thing, it starts getting a little bit longer in the year. So I, I'm just gonna um, follow Mr. Robinson and just say, I hope that this isn't just kind of pushed ahead and crossing our fingers that it's gonna work. But thank you for your efforts. Thank, thank you. you. Autumn, Ms. H Ms. Hendrickson. I, I mostly, I guess I have a question for you guys. Um, I think as a student, I, 
this like, um, you know, the working committees and the working groups and everything, I, it's very concerning to me because this impacts me and my peers and this is the first time I'm hearing about this. Um, like, you know, who are, who's a part of these committees? Can, can, can we go to them? Are these things that we can attend? And, and like, and I, I mean, like, and I, I hear you like, you know, saying, yeah, I think that that information needs to be circulated because I, I can think of like seven kids off the top of my head who would probably go to these things. It's just, it's really hard for us. Um, I mean, like I'm taking time away from my homework to be here um, and so like when I, if I had to come to a school committee meeting every Thursday to just you know first hear of this <laughs> it, it, it's it's very it's very concerning because as a member of the RMHS community and a, as a member of the Reading Public School community I, I think that this information needs to be more public and these working groups, even if they're working groups, need to be accessible to the public. Students, students need to have information on this because I can't imagine how many students would want to say, oh, let me talk, let me talk, let me, oh, I have something to say, if it was like put in the morning announcements or in the Pathways newsletter. Although I don't know how many of them read that, but still, uh, <laughs> still. So there was, um, there was um, some. Just here. can I just wasn't there students answered the survey, Chris? Yes. The students got the survey. So they were, there was I think almost 500 students did answer y the survey. I know that. Okay. I, oh no, I complete. I mean, um, so being I at those meetings. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, there is no working group yet, so no. where I need to, yeah. we need to form it. So, would you like to be on it? Um, <laughs> so, right. Um, happy to invite you. I think it's important to have student representation in a working group about homework because they're the ones doing the homework. Uh, so w we absolutely need to have that. So on one of my tasks for over December break is to craft communication around the working group, the purpose of it, and the pur you know purpose, purview, timeline, and communicate that out. Uh, so you are hearing it really first as we're communicating it out to the to the public for the very first time. Um, and we did have student representation on the late start committee as well um, so uh, you know in terms of that working group you're on board if you want to be and, and okay. just as an aside um, in the four months that we've been working together um, principal Boynton and I have been talking about the schedule looking at the schedule it's been a very long time since Reading High has looked at the schedule and then honestly regardless of the vote tonight, in reading 1,500 separate surveys and seeing over and over and over again the comments about homework and stress and activities and that whole race to nowhere concept, this is, this, I mean, we looked at them and went, whoa, we whoa. Look so we were, we were already talking about forming that committee as soon as we opened those surveys and started reading them. We knew it existed, but when you see it over and over and over again, it's very telling. So um, that's completely like one more bite of the apple as as uh, Mr. Corey said. Um, the late start, as far as sleep deprivation, I think we don't always know when we're as tired as we are, and that exacerbates everything else, and that's what the pediatricians that we spoke to talked about, that a lot of teens aren't even aware of how sleep deprived they are. Uh, it exacerbates their mental health, it exa exasperates their anxiety level, and frankly, their bodies don't heal as fast in general. So um, that's, you know, we definitely want input on these committees, absolutely. Right. Um, Thank you. Yep. Can you just make, make sure to state your name. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anne Marie Corey. I'm a parent of a senior and also I teach here at the high school. Um, and I just want to just follow up a little bit on kids not knowing how tired they are. Um, in speaking to some of my students, they um, regularly come to me second block and, and they're waking up and they talk about how they sort of slept through first block. Um, I used to, like last year I had an A block English class and I never had behavior problems um, because they were asleep. And, and I'm not, I mean, it's true, I'm not trying to be funny, they were literally just waking up. And what I, what my hope is, is that if we give them time to wake up, perhaps they'll enjoy being here more. Um, perhaps they'll be more engaged with what's happening. They'll get better 
engagement and education out of their classes, there will be less that their teachers have to give them for homework maybe, because they might be able to participate more actively in their classes. This is the kind of thing that I suspect is going to be um, exponential, rather than the, you know, not to harp on the 51 minutes, but I think it's going to go beyond the actual minutes. I'm hopeful um, in, for several years, I, I mean, I'm not a fast starter myself. I can get here and I can teach, but I know that I'm better an hour into the school day. I know that I can do it, but I know that I'm a different person an hour later, and I know my students are different. Um, and I, I see kids walking around kind of sleepwalking, and um, it really breaks my heart. I want them to be laughing and talking in the hallways. I want them to be loud. I, they're supposed to be loud. They're high schoolers. They're supposed to be crazy, and they're not. They're like zombies, mm -hmm. um, and it breaks my heart, and I'm very hopeful that we can teach them how to manage their time differently and work with them to give them a better sleep cycle um, so that maybe they can be happier people. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. I think I saw one other hand. Hello. My name is Sarah Picard. I have a uh, fifth grader and a seventh grader in the district. And I just wanted to um, extend my s extreme support for moving to an 8.30 start time. Um, I too have been wondering when Reading would take this up. I first became aware of the serious health impacts for uh, sleep deprivation and emerging research in circadian rhythms and what happens for kids and adolescents um, in my work at, the, uh, at Boston Children's in the Pediatric Weight Management Program where we were talking about this 10 years ago and have been talking about it since. Um, so my husband and I are from this area originally. We were so proud to get our kids into the Reading School District, and I just don't want to see them get left behind as our peer districts and uh, neighborhood schools uh, move to a later start. We can see that grades are better, the health indicators are better, uh, mental health is better, everything is better with you know later start time and uh, more sleep in the morning, and I just don't want to see our kids get left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, if uh, I'd like there's to see. There is? Oh. Okay. Maureen Hurley, third and final time. Um, on the note, I know one of the things they talked about were um, athletes getting more sleep, better for their bodies. Um, as of right now, and I know, I believe it was one of the spring meetings, one of the gentlemen, I don't know which one, we, there was an, a rough estimate that maybe two-thirds of the student body were participating in sports. Um, I can attest from my own child and uh, probably most of her teammates, they are not even close to eight hours right now. They're probably more like five to six hours. And that's not time management, that's literally get up, go to school, get the bus, come home, eight, 8.30, shower, dinner, hit the homework for three or four hours. I mean, bed before midnight, 12.30, that's not happening. That's not time management. That's just time that doesn't exist for them. So it's very encouraging to hear that that homework, I mean, three or four hours, and these kids should be doing extracurriculars. It's not a matter of, well, you gotta pick and choose. This is their time to do this. They're gonna have to work and do those other things when they're adults in life, but I mean, 8.30 start, still not gonna get them anywhere close, and that is a majority of them. Some of these kids are such arduous students and great athletes. They're such hard workers, but they are grinding six days a week, at least, and some of them have jobs and do whatever. Um, so, you know, and I know that, Mr. Zay, you would probably know this better, that um, time, game times and everything, every, I know that we didn't do it for the fall, but those are gonna get pushed back, correct, now that the league is kind of trending that way? They already are. For, for this past fall, they were pushed back? Yeah, other districts. Okay, they were starting late though, right? Games were still starting late sometimes? Where they were coming from, okay, right. So, I mean, my concern is, again, if, if the homework doesn't give, and we, we that, all these pieces coming together, is that, okay, now my kid's simply gonna just be going to bed at two o'clock instead of one o'clock. Um, and again, it's, it's still the same amount of sleep, so. 
again, just so many components that need to come together that, again, I am not seeing the concrete answer to say this is how it's going to happen. It's still a big question mark to me. Thank you again. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Ms. Boyd, any questions? So just this, with the daily schedule, uh, what type of, how many study periods do the students get? <laughs> <laughs> I think that varies, uh, <laughs> right, Autumn? Uh, I think your typical student will have maybe one study a day, or you can attest to this as well, uh, or, or none. Um, we generally don't support students having more than one study a day. <laughs> So I think that's really on average our guidance department. Linda, you probably could speak to this more than anybody. It's about one study a day or? The general freshmen uh, have a study every other day just depending on how they're peaking and how the fall. Sophomores have a study every other day and they have a study I'd like to, I think that we've had a good discussion, appreciate our staff, and I, I think um, it's been clear that um, we've got an outstanding staff that clearly understands a, a, lo a lot of the pieces in the ecosystem, whether it's the homework, the screen time, the logistics on getting to the school, these things all are gonna need to be addressed should the committee um, decide to move forward. And um, we'll definitely work on making sure that there are updates to the committee, um, certainly in person, as well as I think uh, other mechanisms will certainly be in play. But I'd like to ask, uh, we have a motion, um, Dr. Doxa. I move to approve the recommendation to change the start time at Reading Memorial High School to 8.30 a.m. beginning in the 2019-2020 school year. Thank you. Second. Second. Mr. Bottom. Can I just ask about how we're wording the motion? Do we, do we want to take the approach that we just heard, which is for the school committee to specify an 8.30 start time, or would we consider an alternative approach of authorizing the superintendent to delay and his staff to delay the start time at RHA and RNHS up to one hour? Which, would allow, which is a different authorization. It's a broader authorization that allows the superintendent and the staff to respond to these concerns that may come up, gives them the flexibility and the authority, in my view, to be able to do what they think is best after all these concerns are evaluated. So it's to say they can do the 830 plan if they think that's best. That's, that's within the scope of what I'm suggesting. It also allows them to alter that plan as long as it's not more than an hour delay or whatever delay, so it would just be up to an hour. So, so your amendment would be basically to, so you would suggest that um, change the start time at Reading Memorial High School. Um, Authorize the superintendent, who's our only employee. Yeah. So it's the only person we can authorize. So we'd mm -hmm. authorize the superintendent to delay the start time at RMHS up to I just, time, I just starting the work. school year, up to one hour. He can do 8.30 if he, if he thinks that's best. He's authorized to do that. But I just want to build in the flexibility. We're going to have these working groups. We've heard these concerns from students in the community. I just want the administration to do what's best for students. And I'm mindful of the fact that I'm not the smartest guy in the room on this. And I don't want to be telling the world that it's got to be 8.30 or nothing. So if we change it to move to approve the recommendation to change the start time at Reading Memorial High School and authorize the superintendent to, um, I would strike the whole thing and just say authorize the superintendent to delay the start time at, at RMHS for up to one hour. I'm just, yeah, I guess I'm a little concerned. I think that right now the superintendent has the ability to, to fluctuate. If we give him an hour, he can follow the plan. He could do 20, yeah, he, he could do anything he wants. He up, could come back to, and uh, that, say that, that Anything that he wants that, that, we, that he would recommend to us based on the input he gets from his team. I just want to preserve the okay. flexibility. I just I feel like if we vote on the motion as written, I would I would prefer to vote against that motion and vote on a different motion that just gives the superintendent the the authority to be able to delay the start time up to an hour. Okay. Don't be my preference, but I'm, I'm in favor of the delayed start time if that's what's best for students. I just I just hear there are going to be working groups, there are going to be considerations that this isn't like 
We don't know when the rise start time is. There's a lot of question marks, as one of our, our uh, speakers pointed out. And I just want to be respectful of the fact that not all voices have been maybe heard and considered. And, but, you know, on the other hand, we want to be, be responsive to the scientific evidence. We've heard that a one hour delay could be really beneficial. Yeah. So, right. trying to do both. So, so can we I just ask a question about the, so that doesn't, it doesn't move it past 8.30. Correct. Yes. Up to, okay. up to so one hour. one hour could become 50 minutes, okay. is that? Okay. That would be a thought that it, it could be the exact plan that we see before us now. I just don't want to, I, I am less comfortable with voting on an exact, it's got to end at, what do we say? That's, well, you know, a 3.02 p.m. because the school committee said so, right? I, I, I'm not comfortable having that level of detailed intervention in the schedule. It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know do I want this committee to have to vote again if the superintendent right, right. feels it should be 301. And, and we're not, and can I, can I ask yeah. another? Yeah. And we're not, we're not, uh, we're not telling the superintendent he can't do anything that he hasn't already proposed. We're just yeah. saying, no, maybe it's not going to I'm broadening the authority of the Exactly. I'd like to just ask, um, hold on, if the Assistant Superintendent or Superintendent see any issue with it, the motion, if we are basically authorizing the superintendent to delay the st RMHS start time up to one hour for the 1920 school year. So we change that word. I, I don't see any issue with it. I, will tell you that 8.30 is the time that I want to do, uh, based on, you know, I've, I've been involved with the working group, I've been listening to them, I've been reading the research. I, okay. So, I, it's fine either way. Okay. I'm, I actually don't feel comfortable with taking away our recommendation, like not supporting the research that's happened. So, I wouldn't just authorize the superintendent, I would recommend um, that the superintendent, if I were to change oh. it this way, to be broader, mm -hmm. to leave more leeway, I would recommend the superintendent extend. Recommend um, and authorize. Yes. So if we, if we change it to move to recommend and authorize the superintendent to delay the start time at RMHS up to one hour. For the Yeah, for the 2019-20 school year. Is that, Dr. Doxer? Um, my question is whether that undoes some of the groundwork the committee has done in their research and where they've come to to, to arrive at the 830. Um, I hear the concerns about it, but to go back to scratch, someone um, called me on the nine months. Nine months can fly by like this. We've already gotten to a place where those in the know who know our children best are saying that this is the best decision. Now let's work around the other logistics and conditions. And so if we take it back and open up the discussion about the time, then we're gonna lose that momentum that we need to make sure all the other pieces are in place to deal with the homework. I don't want them spending more than their time on the negotiation of the 830 time if we could be spending their time, which is finite mm -hmm. time. Ms. Sparowski. I actually think I tend to agree with Dr. Doxer on this. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the wording, the proposed amended wording, um, because we have heard a recommendation from our superintendent, from our assistant superintendent, from our high school principal, from our director of guidance, and their recommendation is 830. In the event that some logistical thing comes up in the future, we've said, we want to hear if there is a problem. You've got nine months to figure it out. Come back, we can have that discussion. Um, one of the things we all said is we want to communicate very, very clearly. By voting on the 8.30 time, we are communicating to the public, we are moving forward with this change. That is the plan. We have nine months to implement it, but that is the plan. If we change the wording to up to 8.30, that actually becomes very unclear. Mm -hmm. We could be discussing in six, eight, 12 weeks, whether it's 8.20 or 8.30, but not up to 8.30. I think it actually introduces a fair amount of uncertainty, is uncertainty a word? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I think it could create some unintended consequences and I'm uncomfortable voting for 830 given the recommendation and the two meetings we've had and I, I, I like the clarity that that commits, communicates to the community. That's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Robinson. So, I I actually like the the, the that it's vague and it gives the the committee flexibility and, until Ms. Borowski made her last point and it's a big thing with me right now is communication yeah. and 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 message and and you know you're right I mean we maybe being vague is not a good thing here uh, because uh, you know it keeps people guessing. Uh, mm -hmm. So. You know, I guess I was looking until I heard that last part, and maybe I'd be more comfortable with saying 830. I think the, the reality is the, pr the process, the operational processes does in fact allow for Dr. Darty to say adjust that if it needed to be a five minute adjustment for some reason, what something comes up that that we that we say that challenge cannot be met without a small change. He, they, ha we, they, they, they have that ability even with this vote. But so we, we where, where is the discretion of the superintendent if we stay with 8.30? Is it, if we say, well, five minutes, oh, that's de minimis, that's fine. I it's not 60 minutes, so no. where is it? Where is I, it 45, is it 50, is it 13? I, Dr. Stardy, I believe we've seen adjustments up to change? about 15 minutes. Yeah, I've, well, I've made adjustments before 15, 20 minutes and, you know, over the years. Not, but not the other way, right? It would, it no. would only be. Not here at the high school. No, not no, at the no, high school. I'm no, saying if you change this, it wouldn't be going to 840. It would no. be going oh, yeah. the other no, way. No, no, the other way. Yeah. He did, I'm just saying, it, Nick was saying, like, you know, what's that range? And it's probably typically been more 10 minutes, but maybe up to 20 in it, your tenure. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm just curious yeah. what people think. If I could just offer, it, the, the motions that other school committees have taken in the Middlesex League or in other communities have done is, has been a specific time. <laughs> And, and do they hold their superintendents to that time? Has that been the experience of? The school committee takes a vote on a time. I, I understand that. And then their superintendent just implements that. And then did change, I don't know if it's come up yet because it's so recent, but did changes in that time have to come back to the committee again? It's a, no. Is that the, no. Not, no. They didn't come back to the committee. I can't, I was trying to think, was there one school district that did make an adjustment and they came? Yeah, so, so what, what I hear people saying in this discussion is that there's, there's an approach that we're considering where we just kind of nail down this 8.30 time and we let everything flow around that. We're mm -hmm. saying we're gonna, we're gonna fix that, right? That's what you're saying. Let's, let's put that stake in the ground, so yep. to speak, and then let's build the homework committee and the, all these other screen implications time. we're talking yeah. about, mm -hmm. uh, screen time and the, the right start time. Let's build that, fit that in the, nine, the next nine months around that. That's, that's, that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. right? okay. Can I just one other thing? Uh, Maybe I don't want to put too much on people's plates, but maybe for the next meeting, I'd like an update on the the homework committee and how that's been formed, and maybe. also the uh, the rise uh, parent meeting or whatever that that. I, I so that's January seventh. Yeah, I think we should. Well, well not January seventh. Yeah, I'm so not sure. So yeah. it's the second yeah. meeting in January. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I in, in, in January. <laughs> Can't wait until February or March. No, so, uh, no, right? No, I understand that. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, school starts again on the second, right. so right. I'm so not sure there'd be any. Sometime in Jan. Right, perhaps so one of the meetings in January, we can get an update as yeah. part of even reports. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the motion can as stands. Do we want to vote on the amendment? Yeah. Did, did, was there an amendment made? I yeah. I did. Okay. Was it seconded? Ah. No, no, no I believe no. so. <laughs> do you want to? Do you I can't second my own. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> Nick's motion. I'll just, I just want to clarify. The amendment, the, uh, we're gonna, the amendment was, <laughs> all right. The amendment was to change the wording to move to recommend, uh, move to recommend and authorize the superintendent to delay the start time at RMHS up to one hour. Well, it's 8.30 for the F school year, uh, 1920. Right, it's a strike all the language. Right, right. so that was your, your amendment was really a strike language, replace it with this. That's it. Okay, so that's I'm his motion, hold on. He, his, that's his amendment. I know, but his was not the recommendation. Is he, are you comfortable with adding that? Because yours was authorized as superintendent. Linda had a friendly amendment. With a friendly, yes. I'm, I'm you were okay with that? I, I just okay. wanted to make sure. That. So I'll, I'll second it. Okay. Okay. And now we, first we have to vote on the amendment and then we would go back to okay. voting on the motion. Okay, so all those in favor of the amendment as stated. 
So, all those opposed? All those opposed. Unless there's a lot of abstentions. Okay. <laughs> all right. But it was a good discussion, Nick. That's all I said. It was. All right. And so the motion, as when, will you reread it? So, move to approve the recommendation to change the start time at Reading Memorial High School to 8.30 a.m. beginning in the 2019-20 school year. Second. There you go. Um, all those in favor? And that's a 5-0 vote, and there's no one here to oppose, so. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to really thank the community um, who came out and provided feedback and emails and spoke to us. Um, really appreciate that dialogue and your support and the time it took to write some very articulate letters. Um, and especially, I'm just going to thank Autumn specifically as really a student who came out um, to speak on behalf of herself and her peers, and we really appreciate it. And, um, I'm quite sure you're going to be part of the um, working groups going forward, so appreciate that. So, thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Um, you guys are welcome to stay unless you want to hear the quarterly update, the FY19 budget and the FY20 budget overview. <laughs> John, you have five minutes for the rest of the night. <laughs> 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 Goals and objectives, I nope. I said two words today, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> Quarterly personnel update. <laughs> oh, Jen, Jen thank Jen's you. Already ready there. Ready oh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I have the first quarter uh, personnel update for you tonight. Um, some things you're going to see are pretty consistent with some of the previous uh, personnel quarterly reports that we've put out, um, but we did try to make a couple of changes uh, to help increase some of the clarity, so I'll just walk through that with you. Um, our first quarter personnel report um, is inclusive of all relevant personnel actions uh, between July 1 of 2018 and December 14 of 2018. Um, as you'll see, we've hired 64 new, um, what we are considering professional employees. Um, so again, this is teachers, administrators, paraeducators, custodial workers, um, and secretaries, not inclusive of uh, cafeteria workers, daily substitutes, our long-term substitutes, coaches, our extended day staff, or any other short-term seasonal or temporary staff. Um, what we've kept here for you um, is a chart of the FTE calculation. We um, had made some changes from some of the very original reports to um, make it so all of our positions reflect um, in an FTE. For example, some of our paraeducator positions we typically look at in biweekly hours, whereas our teacher positions we're really looking at um, in our FTE which is, for example, like a 1.0 teacher is 70 bi-weekly. Um, so we've, we've laid that out for you again, just to make that clear. So everything you're seeing um, in the tables moving forward is gonna be in that same um, measure. What we've done new is from tables one through 10, so that's pages one through five. This is a list of all of our newly hired employees. Before we would give this to you in one table, uh, so just be one giant table of all of our new, newly hired in order from um, our, from like, from our July 1 onward. What we've done is separated that out by schools, and you'll also see one for district. Um, what we've done at the bottom of each of those tables, so again, that's tables one through 10, what we've done is also highlighted for you uh, the total FTEs for each of those, um, either the, for each school building or for the district table as well. Um, so that's going to be a total of 53.68 FTEs that you're going to see in those 64 newly hired positions. So these are all brand new, uh, newly hired employees. Jenna, do you want to take what? questions we, on any of that or go through the whole, whole piece first? Um, I will, let me run, I'll run okay. through it, and then afterwards, if we have anything, I'm happy to go back. Okay. Um, 
So moving forward from that, uh, what we've also done in previous reports is just given you a little outline in um, table 11 of the reasons for the vacant position. So what this helps to really highlight is reasons why these positions were open and why we need to hire for them. It's not just purely that someone may have left and resigned from the position. Oftentimes we do have um, teachers who are taking a one-year leave of absence. We may have teachers, um, other staff who are transferring into other positions within our district. So just because we're hiring 64, hired 64 new employees didn't mean 64 left us. Um, so I think it's really important for us to highlight that out as well. Um, also, we had some newer positions that came about. Um, some of those also new because of um, last year's approved override. Um, so you will will have a table on that later uh, in the report that I will go through. But I just thought it's, it's important for us to reflect that as to why we're seeing these vacant positions. Um, so you'll see that in the number as well as there's a percentage of those total. And this table is using the information from the previous tables, one through 10, so our, our total 64 employees. Um, moving forward from that, um, in our table 12, what we've done, which we started doing, I believe, just in last year's reports is really reflecting out for you what of those positions were budgeted. Um, so you'll see that in table 12. And then in table 13, which of those positions were restructured positions? In table 14, we'll show you which of those positions were an add to staff. So they were either newly created, and here I've also reflected um, new positions that were uh, created new because of the approved override, so they essentially were budgeted for, but newly created. Um, table 15, we always try to reflect out on what our current open job requisitions are. So currently in the district for, um, we have many a position still open, but these, uh, for example, some of the long-term sub, which I think Sharon spoke to a little bit earlier, we don't reflect on those in the personnel report. Again, we are looking more at our, um, you know, our quote unquote professional, more permanent positions. So um, you'll see here, we currently have uh, five that are open in that category. And then table 16 is specific to teachers and separation of teachers from the district. So as we've done in previous reports, you'll see table 17 gives you um, a bit of a definition for the reasons for separation that you see in table 16. So we've represented that um, in the amount of teachers and you'll also see the percentage of which, of the total. Um, and considering last year's past override, we felt it appropriate to report out on uh, kind of where we're at with those positions and um, feel free to take a look through. You'll see some labeled as retained. What that means is that this position, um, due to the override passing, we were able to keep. So whoever was in that position, um, is retained in it and, st and would have stayed, we would not have reduced that position. Um, filled externally is if, you know, if it were a new position, we'd have to fill that, so we're pulling from outside to do that. Um, also, some of our positions that um, may have needed to be retained, for example, you'll see, um, I believe it's one of the middle school positions that's filled externally. That position, for example, would have been retained, but it was a separation um, from a teacher from the district so we had to go out and, and hire for that. Um, but I just wanted to quickly run through kind of what that looked like. I'm happy to go, now go back through if there's any particular area you're looking to, to question. Yeah. Mr. Robinson. So uh, I found that what I was, I was wondering <laughs> where uh, the position that Heather Leonard filled, which is yep. on page nine, I yep. guess. But shouldn't that also be included? Because that is a, that was a new position. Yeah, shouldn't so that be included in table four as well? If we 
hired a new principal, we know that. We yes. Have. So you're, are you asking why you're not seeing Heather Leonard represented? Or why you're... Well, I think she is on page, page nine. 9, but I think she should also be reflected in table 4 because that's a that's a new we only show this the humanities curriculum. Yes, so what we're representing and what we're basing off of and this is what we've historically done, obviously if we're looking to expand out on that, that's something we can definitely look to do. What we've done is we've used our new hires to really drive the report. So that was an so that was an internal transfer into that position. We did not pull anyone new out. So we've never reflected any positions that have become vacant that were filled internally. We've always reflected out on who we've newly hired. So that is a component that's never been a part of it. Obviously, if that's information we're looking to see, I mean, that's definitely Correct. something as we can provide. The budget book has the right number of FTEs, yeah. that's all I Yes, so yes. Fine. So I guess, so this is, we don't, exp we haven't ever expanded out into that. So there are, yes, positions in the district that have been filled internally. Um, we've always tried to represent are new and work from there, but it's definitely information we could provide. Thank you. Mr. Bobby? So, table 14. 14. I'm sorry. 14. 14. Yes. The new positions at the staff. So, yep. can you just explain so that I understand the override, I understand the restructure idea. Sure. When we have these new partial FTE positions, what, what's the origin of the, those are positions that were not originally in the budget book and they were not in the override, right? Correct. So help us understand that it seems like the special ed director for someone or others are regular, I mean, maybe Dr. Yeah, Ray can speak to that word. I don't why we need that in position, why not? Okay. Yeah. Fraction of position, I mean, they're, they're really in 50 hours from that, right? Feel free to step in at any moment, but um, oftentimes we are constantly evaluating and reevaluating the support that we need for students. Um, you'll tend to see this more often in our special education realm. Um, that is kind of ever changing. Uh, we try to capture that as much as we can, but there's often times that we have needs, students who have needs that we don't have the staff for that could come out from, you know, at pretty much at any time that could transfer in. Um, you know, they could be looking at 45 day placements as well that we'll do here. Um, so that's kind of constantly being reevaluated. So there may be a time in which we have no other choice and there might be a legal mandate that we need to provide services for the students and we need to make sure that we have the staff to do that. So oftentimes when you're seeing a new position like that, pop up that's typically the reasonings behind that if i'm missing anything feel free to it, the only one the, these we brought to your attention on uh, it it was either the, the last meeting in august or the first meeting in september so that was part of the discussion the only exception would be the 0.47 regular regular uh, educator which is just recently yeah. been uh, assigned and it's for a specific uh, learning issue so yeah for for I understand that everything that's a point four seven here in table fourteen that's new and not override is special regulated. So I yeah. see that right, yeah. right there, and, and we have a legal mandate to meet, as you point out, Jen, the, the student needs. Uh, and, and so, Dr. Ray, that was part of our discussion. Was that the discussion where we were moving funds into special ed from regular day? No, no, August. no. We haven't moved any funds this year. Okay. Those so, were yeah. items that we had previously discussed that we shifted expenses within the special ed cost center. So we reduced other areas such as professional development, supplies, materials, in order to fund these positions all within the special ed department. Okay. I, I think it's important to, from my perspective to keep an eye on adding FTE to the district. Um, and it, it, to the extent it's not voted on in an override or it's not replacing an FTE. I, I really like how you did this in Table 14 to spell out exactly where they came from. For, in, for me, that's a very significant component of managing a budget long term, is understanding how and when we add FTE to the overall yep. uh, size of the district. I think that drives a lot of the decisions where we end up having to make when we talk about budget. Yeah. So. so to that point, but Gail, you just stated really the, the, the reason in brackets for the three special education, or the, the note there would be that expenses were, redu were reduced. There was a shift within the budget. There was a shift budget. and just, and I'll be 
you say I'll look to, to Sharon as well. These decisions are made, I will say, in large discussions. These happen in meetings with DLT. We review the, the rationale, the reasoning. We, we look to make sure if it's mm -hmm. specifically driven on an IEP, if we have students moving into the district, if needs change. So these are typically discussions that happen over, I will say a lot of these happened over multiple months before decisions were made where we do, there is a lot of pushback, there's a lot of auditing of the grids of the impacted teachers and students to make sure we are meeting the needs and a lot of this does go back to the discussions we've had to make sure we're constantly ensuring we're auditing the IEPs and making sure we are meeting the needs of the students before any of these so positions are added. So is the, the regular education para educator at point four seven? is that's related to an IEP? I, or? It's a specific student issue which I really can't get into okay. any detail. Um, yep, Mr. Robinson. Jen, uh, so yep. uh, I just wanted, were you done? I'm sorry, I just, uh, I wanted to ask a question on ta table 15. Uh, so what would you say, uh, I mean, this doesn't look like a, su a supply problem. Is it, is it compensation or the fact that you just can't find people that are gonna work uh, point eight or whatever? The reasoning for, is there a specific, a specific line you're really looking at? The that really concerns me, uh, and that's not your fault, I mean, is, is the rating specialist, because We've been so down that's this road. It's yeah. She just that's an individual. Yes. It's a just retirement. retiring. Oh, okay. She's it was a mid-year. Um, so, yes, currently it's it's t currently filled with okay. the current incumbent, but we are we posted, obviously, a prior to her leaving so that we could okay. make sure that, that we could, that, yeah. When I saw that, because yeah. we ran yeah. into that mm -hmm. And the person is currently in the yeah. position. Yes. So she, okay. She's retiring. Tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. tomorrow. Okay. yeah. <laughs> but oh, back to the yeah. question, though. Yep. You say that, that what's your biggest challenge in filling positions? Are compensation or just because some of them aren't? 1.0 FT. Yeah, it would it would depend. Obviously, I mean, if we're talking a little bit more about teacher positions, yes, anything below a 1.0 tends to, you know, I mean, it, there's a different pool typically that's applying that's applying for any sort of part time. Oftentimes, those pools, yes, are smaller. So I, it would be fair to say that typically hiring for a 0.6 position tends to be more challenging. Um, I can't speak fully for every position in that way. I mean, I think it depends on what the position is, at what, you know, what level it's at. Um, those all have factors. I would typically say when we're looking at teachers more specifically, yes, FTE plays a big part. Um, we're pretty competitive in our um, compensation for our um, first couple of years in our salary table. So I, I don't see that as being, at least in what I have gotten in response, as much of a concern. Um, but Just good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just add one more piece to that? Um, some of it's also the time of year. So it's a lot easier yeah. to hire someone in uh, April, May, June yep. for the following year when the pool, there, there were more candidates in the pool. Right now, if a teacher would leave or a paraeducator leaves, it's a lot more difficult because the pool is not as deep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for putting the override table together. Yeah. Uh, 18. We just need to tell the voters this is what you thought for yep. this, and we are very grateful. This 20 FTE yeah. it makes a huge impact on our students and staff, and I can't, mm -hmm. I couldn't overstate that enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for transparent and, and labor-intensive accounting, <laughs> because I think that's helpful for the taxpayer to see that we're, we're spending your money in a way yep. that is transparent and we're accounting for every dollar and we're showing exactly what you purchased for our students. We're great. Dr. Dox, two, two things. One was um, you took some of my words out Sorry, of my mouth. That. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I just wanted to, I remember 
some of your previous presentations and we were ruthless in <laughs> asking no. questions and asking <laughs> for more and asking for this progression that you gave us here. When I was going through it, I would start with the first chart and I'd think, this question, and then in the next chart, you answered that question, and the next chart, you answered the next question. And so I just wanted to thank you, because you, you put yourselves into our head, and you listened to us, and you gave us the information we've been asking for in a, a really palatable, easy to understand way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the, the question that I had was, and it was partially answered about the reading specialist who's retiring. Yeah. Yes. Um, but was about the other positions that are open. Are they um, also positions that have someone there right now so they're not gaps in the um, IEP programs? Or are they, I mean, are the services, they, I'm sorry, it's table 15. Yeah. So are, they, are there gaps in services that kids are being, needing to receive right now and how are they getting those services? Yes, it, it, they, those would be a combination typically for the paraeducators. I believe one of them is one of the new positions yeah. that we opened based upon student needs. Yeah. When we have open positions, we have both paraeducation substitutes as well as teacher substitutes yeah. that we bring in to ensure that we have the coverage. So if a position is open, we bring in individuals to fill the need while we are recruiting on the position. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Sorry, Jen. No, please. <laughs> and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jen. The, with the exception of the the business teacher, these are all fairly new correct. Yep. vacancies. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Correct. Are, are these open positions on budget? Are they? Are they budgeted? Are you, if, are you asking if any are new? We had the. Pair, what was the, the yeah, was the para the, the I believe the coolish para is yeah. one of the yeah. new unbudgeted positions that we added earlier in the year via using other expenses but not current within special ed. <laughs> but not currently in the not in the open rat, no. Oh, not not currently open. Right. So if you're looking in He's looking at specifically at table fifteen. Right. Table fifteen Army Chess and Butch. There's a right. There's Coolidge was up above already, right? So right, the question is on those new in Table 15. Yeah, no, we, yeah. no. I think those were existing. Yeah, I think they're all existing. existing. I think those were all existing. Yeah, those those were all existing. Yeah. So in this whole report, if I just. Nope, they are. They're all existing. So we have 3.17 a... FTE in this report. If I look at just Table 14, the new that are not override with 3.17 FTE over the combined budget plus override. Well, override is the budget. So three, three FTE over budget, right? Yep, 0.85, right, 0.85, and 1.0 in special ed. All these, all these nibbles add up. Yeah. 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 Right, that's, is that a fair characterization? Yeah. If, if I add those four new positions? Yes. Yeah, I would yeah. say roughly, yes. Right. Yes, roughly, that's correct. yes. And, yeah. and largely responsive to, in fact, all Special education. To They're all students. Correct, students. correct. Students. yes. We've got, it. We've got to address the student need. This is how we chose to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, thanks. You, you brought it up, Dr. Tari, so the business teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. uh, and I think you may have told us this. Yeah. What are we doing in, in lieu of that right now? So uh, we currently, it's a, it's actually a total of a 0.8 vacancy, um, in, which is in one of these charts. It's in the last table. So table. there's a 0.8 vacancy uh, at the high school. It's a combination of the 0.6 business teacher and another 0.2 that originally was allocated for the English department, but the English department did not need that <coughs> additional point two. It, we're currently looking at how we can use that position best to fit the needs of students. So uh, Principal Boyton um, is working with a group, uh, a working group to take a look at that. There is a definite need. We just wanna make sure we use the FTE, or the point eight, F eight FTE as effectively as possible. What they realized, because the decisions on how we were gonna break down the 5.0 FTE were decisions that were made last year, um, but the needs changed between last spring and the time we started doing the implementation. So we, we are still offering a significant amount of computer science courses. There's, there's no, uh, 
you know, waiting list or anything like that for the students, so there's plenty of space. So that's why the need not to hire that position. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick comment. Um, I appreciate table 16, something we've been asking about, and just wanted to note that, you know, 78% of the um, the, the reason, 78% of the teachers that left, left for reasons that were not job satisfaction. Um, they, were, they were other things. Yep. Um, so I really appreciate the breakdown and the definitions and thank you. All right, is there any other questions? If not, we'll move on to right, thank the, you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, the quarterly, thank you. thanks very much, Jen. Uh, the <coughs> quarterly FY19 budget update, that's gonna be followed by superintendent's goals and then new, the uh, FY20 pre-budget presentation. Okay. Thank you. Included within the school committee packet, I believe directly after, yes, right, yeah, right after the, the personnel. personnel file is the FY19 budget update. So similar to what we have done in the past, we have the high level summary, which shows that as of um, when we did this, so about December 3rd, we currently have an unencumbered balance of $268,000, which is approximately 0.6% of the budget. This reflects uh, it does include all of the current open positions are reflected within the projection and any known expenses. So when we say encumbered, that's that's what we mean. We have all of the salaries to date that we know about are included in here. We also, as we have done in <coughs> the prior memos, is included two tables which summarize any surplus or deficit by expense category as well as each of the five cost centers. So currently we do have salary savings of approximately $600,000. That is encompassing the salary savings across all five of our cost centers. That includes differences in turnover, so any time in which we've had individuals leave, either from when we did the budget last year up until today, any differences in the salaries that have come in and out. We do see fluctuations that go both ways where we have hired individuals that are higher than the incumbent person as well as instances in which we have hired at lower salaries. Typically within <coughs> some of the specialist areas or particularly within the special education, we do, we have started to see where we do tend to hire at the higher end of the salary scale. So those are areas in which we typically do not see significant salary savings. We also have instances in which positions are open. So in the report that Jen just showed, any of those positions where we had budgeted the full year to the extent a position is open, we capture that within salary savings. Also one of the areas we do budget for is the impact of any potential buyouts we have for retirements. We do not know what that is going to be when we do the budget. So we're doing the budget now. People don't have to notify us until June. If I'm correct, correct. Yeah. June for the following year. So we always put an estimate in there because we, we don't necessarily know how many there are going to be. So we budget a certain number. This year we have less than we had budgeted for, I wanna say by two or three people, but that number does sort of ebb and flow. Um, that we do anticipate some of those salary savings will be eroded as we'll talk about when we get into the special ed, which is a regular ed and special ed item. This is a year in which we actually have three school psychologists that will be going out on maternity leave where this is an instance in which we will most likely be paying three times for one position while the individual is out on sick leave, we will continue to pay them. We also have their role as the school psychologist and then if we are not, counselor, thank you. And then we also have the testing aspect of their position where if we are not able to bring in a substitute that can fill both parts, we will have to mm -hmm. contract that out. So that's an instance where it actually will, it, it's Very a more expensive yeah. endeavor. And to have three go out at the exact same time also does not allow us to try to pull our own internal resources to do that. Mr. Robinson. Can I ask, I wanted to ask before you move on to yeah. special so on, the salary savings line, I, when I saw that I was thinking that so we started the year at uh, 
compensation of two percent. What, what did we start? so? Does this does any of this get get eroded after you catch up the with contract. the new contract? We have reflected the new contract From the, in there the as, as well, and what I is know it's retro, but I just wanted yep, didn't know we, whether the numbers caught up. The yet. numbers did catch up. We did um, thanks to the valiant efforts of my team, Chris, in the back, in the back row, for calculating all of the retros. We do have that, um, some of which we'll see when we get into some of the later um, slides about the overrides. As we know, one of the positions is still open. Some of the stipended positions, we did not have people post for them, so that's why this is sort of a combination, as well as when we had done the override for the salary adjustments, we had anticipated each of the bargaining units, we had set money aside for them, and some of the bargaining units we were able to settle at what we had budgeted for. So the, there's sort of a lot of different pieces. We also have instances specifically within the facilities area where we have people that are out on longer workers' comp issues where we actually have salary savings because they're, they're not currently being paid. So it's sort of, it's a combination across many different areas. Um, special education, we will we'll spend a little bit more time on, but what we do want to remind the committee as well as folks is when we do the budget, so we're in the process of developing FY20's budget now based upon the population that we know a lot can change. This is a very dynamic group of individuals where things change. So, and when we built the budget last year, we did let the committee know that we did not include any unanticipated within our special education out of district tuition. Mm -hmm. Based upon where we were with balancing the budget, we, in, we made a conscious decision not to include any unanticipated with, within that line item, which is now coming to fruition mm -hmm. where we have, as we have historically had unanticipated in that line item, which is causing part of the items that we're having there. Um, and then within other expense accounts, another area that we have seen an uptick in is within our regular education homeless transportation line item. We have, I want to say quadrupled the number of children we are transporting that are deemed homeless based upon the guidelines. So we typically have had, I want to say one to two, maybe three. We are upwards of 10 this wow. year. And that can go anywhere from $30 a day to $200 a day to transport the students, whether or not we can get a cost sharing agreement in. And that's another area where it's very difficult to anticipate where that is going to come out. Um, the next table we do go through in more detail each cost center. And again, a lot of it is the, the salary savings through a host of areas. The one area where we did want to, and I will Mm -hmm. um, definitely thank Sharon and, and Chris for all of their help in pulling together the information in the special education area. We have seen an increase of approximately $368,000 in our out of district transportation and um, transportation and tuition from when we did <coughs> the budget. And again, just reminding folks that was based upon the student population in our out of district in, I want to say the September, October timeframe because we finalized the budget in November and December. So it's, we're well over a year ahead in that population. In addition, we also, as we mentioned, we've had to increase the estimates because we do have three school psychologists that will be going out on maternity leave. We are currently in the process of filling those positions. So we have sort of our best estimate in there now as time goes on we'll have more information on that the staffing additions that gail can i just stop you're talking yep. through the notes on page oh i'm three, talking right? through the notes i just on want page to make three. sure people Sorry. are okay yes yep so the the staffing additions that um, we talked about earlier in the year as well as what jen just walked through are also included in there so the teachers the paraprofessionals and we are closely monitoring the costs that are in there. What we do want to point out to the committee is this includes known items as of today. There are several amounts that could include legal, consultation, and program costs. 
we do anticipate that number is going to increase throughout the year as we work through discussions on, on the process. Those amounts have not been included in these figures today. We will be updating the committee when we do the budgets in January as well as when we do the next update in February. As those night items become more known, we will bring those forth. We do anticipate needing to request an additional transfer later in the year. We just did not feel at this point it was prudent to do it until we had firm commitments and knew what those numbers would be. But we do feel it's important, especially as we are approaching budget season to remind people that we are building the budget based upon what we know as of today and it is a very fluid number that mm -hmm. and Sharon and I, I think we're in each other's office a lot of quality almost every time. day <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is a daily, daily change. So at this point we are going to request the school committee to authorize us to transfer $250,000 from the regular education cost center into the special education Center based upon the expenses we know and are, have mm -hmm. committed to as of this point, and then as things change, we would come back to the committee later in the year if any additional funds were needed. Any questions from committee members? Thank you, Carol. Let me take the committee question. If the, in the committee. Mr. Bob. How many? So this is the first quarter report. So this is our first time moving funds between cost centers and yeah. yeah, FY19. Yeah. So in FY18, what do we move about 700,000? I believe it was, I want to say 500,000. 500,000. So, and then here's another 250 right after that. Right? So the last, going back to last fiscal year, it was about 500 or so, 400 change, mm -hmm. another 250. No, I follow the narrative. This is very, um, this is very detailed and very well explained. Um, again, it's, it seems that, and again, we make these estimates and projections 15 months before mm -hmm. we have to spend the money. Um, but it, I mean, again, it, all the transfers seem to be going in one direction into this cost center. Mm -hmm. And if we yeah. think about it, the timing of when we did the transfers last year was after, after we did the budget, so at that point the budget itself was locked in, so it, it is not unanticipated that we would, especially since we made the conscious decision at that point not to put the unanticipated because we wanted to preserve as much, right. as, much as we could at that point, not knowing where the override was going to go. We didn't want to put unanticipated and then have to cut additional positions not knowing where it was going to go. And, and my question just go to the question of, is, is there any way to get out ahead of the curve in our projections as we go into the next year's budget process? I, I know that's, so that's, I'm sure that's that up. a challenge for everybody. <laughs> yes, we but actually, I will say, and Chris is laughing in the back because I think we've spent more time between mm -hmm. Sharon and myself, um, Sharon's assistant, Anne Marie, where we are currently in the process. One of the things we attempt to do as late in the process as we can is estimate the out of district transportation tuition so we can pull it into next year. Again, what becomes difficult are any of the unknown items that we're currently talking about now. It becomes a discussion do we put them in next year's budget? Do we not? We will say one of the challenges going into next year is that um, we are coming off of a three-year transportation contract with SEAM where it has been a 0% increase for three years. We, that contract is now up. So it is a big unknown going into next year what that would be. A lot of the schools have gone, I'm going to say it's from reconstitution. Mm -hmm. Reconstituted uh, tuition rates. Where we have seen some of them upwards of 18% increases in there. A lot of the private places. These are the private, private, private placements out of district private placements. Out of district that is, private that placements. So mm -hmm. we are trying to wait as long as we can in the budget preparation process to get the best information as possible. But we have spent, I would say, several hours a day over the past couple of weeks and it is individual by individual, case by case, looking at every 
possible scenario. And the, the, t the out of district program tuitions, if I can just comment on that a bit, is that their tuition rate is established by the Operational Services Division of the uh, state of Massachusetts. They are allowed once every six years to request a restructuring and a reconstitution of their costs that they're allowed to charge based on changing student needs that they may have had, which have resulted in them forcing their hand to, hand to change staffing programs, those types of things. Other than that, they're really kept at a very low percentage of increase by the state. So it's that once every six years, they're allowed under the law to go and request a lot more money under restructuring that they all take advantage of it because they've been restricted to a very low percentage increase for the five prior years. So it's not unusual to see these huge increase rates um, requested. And in that process, the um, vendors, the people purchasing those services at that point in time, they have to notify them that we're looking for a reconstituted rate. We will hold a public hearing, basically on why, and you're invited to come. They typically give you 30 days notice of that, and most of my colleagues and in my role are pretty committed 30 days out in their calendar. So it can be hard to get there. Um, I shared with Gail and Dr. Doherty that, you know, I've, I'm new to ready, but I'm not new to this role and um, I would make it a point to try and get to those meetings as often as possible and really ask the hard questions about the why and the how and where did you come up with that number and it sometimes made a difference. They didn't get the full amount they were asking mm -hmm. but it's really tough to get there and ask mm -hmm. the hard questions it's and it's out of our control. We cannot yeah. negotiate a rate because it's set by the state. Right. Mm -hmm. I have a, just a question. So. Set, so first of all, I hear six years, and I'm trying. I'm trying to be polite about who made that decision. <laughs> <laughs> Would, who made? Who does? I mean, six years. That might as well have been a hundred years ago in terms of, of, you know, projecting. They they've had to live on something they projected six years ago up until now. I mean, basically I'd go polar out and increases. ask for the world mm -hmm. as well. I mean, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Is that I, something that our state rep should be doing something about? I mean, that just doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. I guess as it's legislative. But yeah. Again, I thought that there was an opportunity that, that we saw increases year over year in rates uh, of the private placements. I knew the rest I knew that they had this ability to restructure and that the percentages could be could be incredibly astronomical. Right. But I'd rather talk to, I'd rather have them, I'd rather have that discussion every year, you know, when you it might like even it out. Yeah. You know. So is, is, is everybody on their own six year clock? Like yes. Every vendor yes. Has their own yeah, it's not the same six years for everyone. Yeah. Good question. To put it into perspective, public collaboratives, which are actually governed a different way, it's yeah. by, the, by the board of superintendents, um, that budget each year, the average is like 3%. The increase is three percent. But I thought that um, on the this restructuring, and I also remember that sometimes this restructuring isn't done till like after we've just done the budget. So mm -hmm. we've been yeah. hit a couple times with <coughs> we set the budget and then a couple of our vendors restructure to the tune of like twenty percent increase. Twenty percent. Yeah. yeah, I remember one yeah. one year I had a thirty eight percent increase in one of the <sighs> programs and. Um, <laughs> They, they, they were off my list. Well, ever. in some respect, you can't, I mean, you can't blame them if they've been told they have to wait six years to. Yeah. Within, and yeah. live within a COLA increase, yeah. right? So they, they're right. getting a COLA. They get just a COLA similar to yeah. public yeah. schools. It's around, it's around 2%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, similar to public oh, okay. schools. Yeah. Well, we what we're restricted to. Wow. So that's why we do, I will say, when building the budget, this piece is the absolute yeah, last, last piece that I push yeah. the envelope as far as I can to try to get, but I can, I don't even think it's going on a limb. I can pretty much say if I gave you a number today, tomorrow that number would change. Yep. So I, I just want to be sensitive to the fact, like if it's seven, I mean, I'm, I, I favor the transfer that you're talking about and support of it, but I, I want to be just clear how challenging this is from this conversation and that the, the transfers, including this, or if you look at 750000 on a $15 million base, that's a 5% variance. Mm -hmm. We're off by 5%. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to sound a lot like the discussion that others in this town were having around health care costs. Mm -hmm. 
where, where we're having to pay as a district costs that are sometimes enormous, and you cited 38%, I don't know mm -hmm. if it was one of our vendors or not, but it's just not unprecedented from what you're saying. Right. These, these uncontrolled, unbudgetable, mm -hmm. right, increases, I think we can be sensitive to when our six years is up in all of our different vendors, right? But but that doesn't help you, and you can participate in comment, and that's mm -hmm. great, but of course they don't have to listen to right. mm -hmm. the, right. their, their customers, right? Uh, so I think that's just something that I think, I think we need to continue to keep our eye on as a committee because this is a you know a legal mandate. It's student need, and, and we really can't control the costs of the vendors that are the best fit for the students that have that need. Right. Ms. Braski, I share a lot of your concerns, Mr. Bobbin, completely about the transfers and the continued need in this area. There are two metrics I'm going to be looking at in the budget season that specifically address this issue. One is the percentage of our budget going to this cost center, and is that changing exactly. over time? So that's sort of a telling, if so, why, and what does that mean? And the other is pure district percent of budget. So I would think we're somewhat comparable, and we're not. So there, I think there are some metrics we can look at during the budget cycle that will help us tease out if this is how, how much, and my suspicion is it's largely systemic, it's statewide, it's nationwide. Oh, yeah. But there are some things we can look at, I think, that will help tease that out. I completely agree, and I mean, my recollection is I remember the number going from 23 to 30% of our budget over, and I can't remember if it was three or four or five years, but I think it was over four years. Um, and part of the reason for that percent increase that special ed was consuming more and more of the budget was because we were making cuts to regular day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, was, exactly. that was a big So I was very interested in that because right. yep. we're no longer making the regular day cuts. Uh -huh. Thank you, public. Uh, we have added these 20 FTE to mm -hmm. shore up the, the staff and replace a lot of the reductions that were made in the past five years. So now that we're kind of more at full strength of the district, I'll be looking very closely to see what percent um, both FTE mm -hmm. for me and, and the out of district costs. And, and I think if these out of district costs are really just unpredictable, yeah. like 5%, and, and, and that's not, I am not at all negative commenting on, on the work that Gail, you and, and the team have done. Is. I, I'm pointing to the, an external factor that yeah. we, as a district, need to really say, look, it's very hard to run a budget when you're $750,000 off despite state of the art projections. Because the cost can go up nonsensically. Well, and some of it will depend on ultimately where, you know, if, if placements change from, if you go from less restrictive to more. So it, it really can, it, it really can right. change. And it, these are discussions we've, we've started mm -hmm. to have internally and we are looking at what the right model is and we do plan on when we come into the budget season to, to really, look, similar to what we did last year, really make sure we're laying it out for the committee to say, here are the decisions we have made as we are budgeting. Like last year we said, we, in, we are not putting unanticipated in the budget. And here, here, here's the rationale, and, and here, here, here are the pros and cons. And I support to that it. approach. I, I, yeah. I like that approach in the past. I'm supportive of it going forward. I think if you if you don't have a concrete rationale for spending the money, don't guess. And that's also mm -hmm. why we are being very cognizant about the amount we're asking for a transfer now, because we do realize that it, it is a shift between the two cost centers, and we want to be very careful about requesting right. those funds. Yeah, and we, when we, we budget them for regular day. Right. I have a question. I hesitate to ask it, but I'm going to anyways. So these are costs that come up after we've already specified what we need for accommodated costs before our number is set, and before we start our specific budgeting. Because our number is set so the, after the accommodated. This number was set last October. So these are items that a lot of them happen after October, and I will say for the majority of the ones that are impacting us this year, happened in the April, May, okay. June. So it was after financial forum, it was after the budget, it was after the override. A lot of these happened in the spring of last year that are impacting us this so year. So it. It was well after the, the budgeting process. And my, my question is, so we, we're not building in any of that extra, which I also agree with, because if we build in that extra, then we're not doing other things that we need. Mm -hmm. Unanticipated. Um, is, in terms of the discussions around the accommodated 
budget. Mm -hmm. Are, is that only based on bills that we already have? Like now, we're going to go to our accommodated budget with these new placements, and that's going to be added to what we request from the town. The accommodated will be taken out before our budget numbers are set. So Can, the, the difficulty about this, those are conversations we actually do continue to have. I will say we, we have a great, I am very thankful for the relationships we do have with the town manager as well as with the finance committee those are quest those are discussions that have already started to happen if you think about it finance committee approved the spend for next year october 11th so we are two almost three months past that a lot of the items that are caught that are impacting this are items that are happening now and that number has already for next year been exactly. right. determined so it does become a little bit difficult because we do budget an increase each year in the accommodated cost but we are always a year behind because the number gets set so early that we don't know where it's going to be but we have started mm -hmm. to have those yeah. conversations as we're looking at the placements the costs so it is a very open mm -hmm. dialogue that we are having with them so more to come through the budget process through but those process, are discussions yeah. we're so having the question would be and i don't need to keep looking at more yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, I, it, it's a very open i i'm very appreciative of the relationships we do have with the town as well as the finance committee that they are very open to have discussions with us it, it just becomes a timing because those numbers were decided last october and these items are happening now so, so I'm, some of that discussion I'm assuming that you're having is whether there can be more of that anticipated potential Money. cost put into those accommodation, accommodated, the cool. unanticipated, <coughs> unanticipated yeah. accommodated costs. And then if they're not used, then they go back. Like would be if they were in our budget, right. they would go back. But so that would be part of your discussion. So those are we, the ongoing conversations yeah. we have as thank you. As these, and as Chuck alluded to, it's this and, and Nick, this is sort of the same that has happened with the insurance side where it's sort of it, it's ebbs and oh. flows. Some years you try to budget conservatively and it works to your advantage. Other years it may not. So it's I look at it almost the same way that the other accommodated costs work. Um, Alicia, you have a question. I just had more of a, a quick question suggestion because I was kind of chasing my tail. I was looking at the $44 million number and I'm thinking, where did we get $2 million? And I'm looking at the budget book and it says $42 million and it's the override the money. Override. <laughs> Is there a way we could maybe add an addendum to the budget book for last year that has just a page that updates with the plus in blue or I just, I literally was scratching my head messaging people saying, where did the $2 million come from? And then 10 of us figured out it was we the override. Actually, I can, as part of the, I want to say back in earlier in the year, we actually did do that in one of the school committee where they voted the final budget where we had the original budget as approved in all okay. of the did I miss changes. It? So it is in one of the school committee packets. It's in the packet, but it's not in the book that's under the superintendent. It's not in the budget book because the budget book is actually a public document that was presented at town meeting. So okay. I cannot amend the budget book because that's what was actually presented okay. on. But we do have a one page summary that was included. Okay. I don't remember which it school committee July. meeting. Might have been July where we had the school committee July. vote the okay. final budget, which actually walks through every cost center and okay. how the override was allocated. I'm just thinking historically when people go back and look, you know, five years to kind of falling. Yeah. Unfortunately, the budget book is set in stone at the time it is printed gotcha. and distributed and put on and, the website. And it's so the voted record of the town meeting. Right. Right. So I okay. actually cannot amend that. But we, c if you would like, we can recirculate the one page summary that. No, no, no that's okay. I just will, I wonder if there's a way to attach it somehow so people know to look. I don't know, I just. Well, it can be in the, sorry. Yeah. Good. It can be in the budget book for this year, mm -hmm. right? We can put yes. it in. Yes. Okay. So that, uh, that I can yeah. make okay. sure that we have a page that yes. clarifies that. Um, and then I had one other question that was just um, kind of backing up to staff or attention. I'm very sad about the retirement of the Birch Meadow teacher yes. that's happening tomorrow. And I'm just wondering, um, is that position a like a contract position? Like, 
It, I, I don't know how to it's ask a, the question. It's, 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 it's in the bargaining it's within unit. The, the RTA. Yeah. It is, okay. Yeah, it's in the collective bargaining unit. Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. Um, can you read the motion, Dr. Doxer? I'm gonna put the motion on the floor for us. Move to authorize the transfer of 250000 to the Special Education Cost Center from the regular day cost center. Second, is there any further discussion? All those in favor? And that's 5-0. All right. Um, superintendent's goals. Yes. Dr. Dodd, you want to just... Hopefully we'll be quick. Yeah, let's five see if we can... Yeah, I've got <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> All right, get us to the right... Isn't that what you put on? So we're at this... Actually, I think the meeting's already over, Chuck. The, the, update, <laughs> the updated goals are uh, located right after the uh, budget memo. Okay. So um, on the, de at the December 16th, you voted my goals, so... What we could have gone with those goals. However, you did give me a lot of feedback, which I felt after reflecting it would make sense to come back and have the committee vote the revised goals. Um, so let me let me just outline, I, and I've given you both the red line copy and um, the accepted copy yeah. that, that shows the changes. The, the biggest change, uh, there were some minor changes made in dates, Status, things like that, which are captured in the um, in the in the red line. Um, the biggest change is the elimination of the communication goal, and it struck me when Mr. Robinson it was actually Mr. Robinson made the comment that aren't you doing a lot of these things already? And the answer to the question is yes. So it really is a goal that was more maintenance than an actual new goal. So what I've done is I took the, the activities that are happening, which were happening last year as well, and put them at the end as a, a set of bullets. And essentially, those are being embedded throughout all the goals. The other piece that, to remind the committee, when you do the uh, annual evaluation, is that there is actually several uh, elements in the evaluation rubric that focus on communication. Right. So that's always there. So I don't have to have a goal to have communication. Right, because it's what, part of it. what I was trying, the, the goal itself is a goal that's already been going on. It's, there's nothing new in it. So after listening to the comment that Mr. Robinson made and doing more reflecting, I just felt it was better to retire the goal um, and put those bullets as to the things that were happening already um, at the end of the document where it's embedded throughout all the goals. It's also still part of the district improvement plan. It's focus area E. Right. So it's part of the district improvement plan, focus area E, and part of the performance rubric, rubric right. the evaluation rubric. So what I'm asking the committee is that they uh, vote on the revised goals. And John, you adjusted a couple of the timeline, the uh, dates, I think, right? Um, I, I did. It's it's yeah. on the red line. I'm yeah. not sure exactly, but it, that was just more of a maintenance mm -hmm. because that was as of October 30th. A lot of those status and so that reflects more the 12, current. 20. More current. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you put the motion on the floor? Let's put the motion out there and then we'll move to approve the superintendent's goals as revised. Um, can you second. Second. Ms. Sprouse, seconded. Does anybody have any other questions so, for John? Yeah, just, just to clarify, I just asked this in the sidebar, but I'll share it with everyone. So on page six, the goal two, so what the superintendent was referring to is the deletion of this table here, I believe. On page six. Yes, right? in the red line version. Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to go from what he was saying to what was written here, oh, so yeah. that's, that's where she was. Right. The red, I'm looking at the red line version. And so they, that all appears on page 11 of the, the new version. The, the new version is the accepted right. document of the red line version. Right. So it's the clean document to look at 
and it's so that all that communication is on page 11. Right, as these are all embedded. You can't see the red line, of course. It's I it's also remember the goals mm -hmm. of the new version. Mm -hmm. You what? I renumbered the goals of the new version. Took out, that, that's what was confusing. You took out yes. goal two, and there's a new goal two, which is what I was struggling with. But no, it's it. Yeah. So what you're mm -hmm. so, yep, so Mr. what Ron. you're saying is the I guess you call it the communication goal. Uh, that's kind of standard op should be standard operating procedure and not a goal. I mean. If you're not doing something, I want to have the ability to, to go to the evaluation and say, you know, the communication was. Right. And that's. Or if you're doing something right. that we like, we can also. Uh, right. But it's not, it's not one of those, you know, benchmarks that, uh, like it, like it was. And I'm going to continue to provide evidence, even though yeah. Yeah. it's not goal, it's still evidence because it's connected to the root. I actually like this change personally because yeah. I think it focuses. I've talked a lot about having maybe too many goals, and I, I like this because I, I view it as more efficient. And, and I think there are very detailed action items that have been added mm -hmm. um, to the goal format compared to what we've seen in prior years. Yeah. Um, and, and among those are communicating I mean, with everybody in each of those goals. So I support this. Ms. Borowski. I agree. There you go. <laughs> All right, are we to you? Yes. Well, I appreciate the feedback. That's what caused right. The, right. the change. So I appreciate right. the feedback. And we had, when we met last time, we talked about how we didn't typically do this, but then we said it makes sense. Just update it and have yeah. it reflect it. So I appreciate it. Ms. Dr. Ready? Doxer? Yes. So two, two things. One is um, on the page five, um, the goal one student learning goal. I would just add the new select board ad hoc committee as one of those committees that you're going to be participating in. I, I don't I don't know if that they didn't even announce anything. I thought that was the can I guess it, yes. I thought that was the committee to decide whether there needed to be a committee. It is. It's right. 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 Yeah. And the yeah. superintendent is one of the people that they oh. had um, invited to be a part of that. And so um, I just would like that to be under consideration. So would you like to amend the goals? Dr. Zard. So goal two, number 11, I believe already reflects that. Or the new goal two, the new goal two, yeah. number 11. Yeah, so work with police. Yeah, and I had it there too, so I'm satisfied with that if that's what you had yeah. in mind. That's, that's fine with me. Um, and then I also just wanted to make the point that the committee is never limited just to these points in terms of the evaluation. I think that they're, um, these are really helpful and important, but we also have a lot of other information about what's going on in the district um, with which we can do, that can enter into our evaluations. So um, in terms of, this is goals separate from evaluations, right? So the evaluation process, just I want to be clear that when we do the evaluation process, it's a very specific process yeah, this is where the goal, John provides the evidence against the goals and a lot of other information gets brought in through that as, you know, through that evidence. So, the, but they're two different processes. Okay, no, I understand that, okay. but this, this also sorts if I understand it correctly, this sort of outlines some of the things that our superintendent is focusing on that will, during the evaluation, be part of how we define whether he has mm -hmm. succeeded at his goals or not. Yes. And I just wanted to make the point that we have a lot more information than just what is here, that when we ultimately are evaluating your goals, that we can bring into that discussion. So it, I'm not saying it should be added to this. Right. It's part of the this. whole evaluation yeah. process against the goals. Yes. Yeah. All right, any, I think we have a motion and it was seconded. All those in favor? Five zero. All right. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Perry, we're finally at your session. Lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> speaks very fast. She's, she's gonna get to Buffalo tomorrow. She, she's going, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna get packed. Unless you have an epiphany, you can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, sorry, let's. Okay, Gail's taking it away. I'm taking it All away, right. and then, so similar to what we did last year, we wanted to take this opportunity just to give a quick high-level overview. This is not meant to get into any financial discussion. This is really just to set the stage as to what the process is, what comprises each cost center so that when we get into the meetings in January, we can really dive into the numbers. And please do stop me because I do realize I talk very fast. And hopefully you're going to the game. So no, I said it's a home game, so you wouldn't be going to Buffalo to go to the game. I'm going to the game. <laughs> Um, so what we wanted to go through, um, and this was one of the questions we did receive from a committee member, was to provide a quick update on the override. So we felt that this would be an appropriate time to do that because it bridges a lot of what myself and Jen just talked about as well as when we prepare for next year. So we thought this would be a good time to do that. Just reviewing the school budget structure again, high level overview of what the cost centers are, the budget process, the various communications we use, the calendar events, and then open it up for questions. So quick eye chart. So this is, um, just a reminder, this is the slide that we used throughout the override process, and this is what was ultimately approved by the taxpayers in April. So just as a quick reminder how, what the breakout of the override was. We did want to give a quick update, and I won't spend a lot of time, especially on the personnel, because we did, we just did that. cover it, but we thought that this, because this will be posted on the website, also gives everybody sort of a, a quick snapshot. So the teaching positions, there were 16 FTEs that were approved as part of the override. The only positions that remain open, as we discussed, is a point eight at the high school, and that is point two of English teacher and point six of the business. Um, to get to the point eight, that is one that is currently being looked at to determine the best utilization for that. Other than that, all of the other positions were either filled and or retained as, as Jen walked through. The other ads, there were four positions, there were two curriculum coordinators that were one filled internally, one filled externally. Through a combination of the money that was allotted for those positions as well as the money we had set aside for salary adjustments, which were again to attract and retain positions across the district were utilized. We were able to hire the 1.0 computer technician. He started earlier in the summer under Julian Carr's department. And then the combined special education team chair assistant director, as we've mentioned, Allison Wright filled that position, so she was also an internal transfer. The salary adjustments to attract and retain staff, we did feel it was important to sort of spend a couple of seconds walking through that because I know a lot of people look at that as just the, the salary specific amount. So we have, um, settled all of our collective bargaining agreements. There were two of those bargaining agreements in which the salary adjustments were higher than we had budgeted, which were part of this salary adjustment. I think what's also important for folks to remember is that that also went to other items that are included within the bargaining agreements, whether it was additional um, tuition reimbursement, whether it was additional stipends, um, additional planning time, which does re which may require us to bring in substitute teachers to ensure that the teachers get this time. The other part too that we do want to remind folks is that anywhere in which we pay either the curriculum rate or the per diem rate, as those rates go up, our tutoring expenses within special education also go up commensurate with that. Our extended school year costs also go up commensurate with that. So it's not necessarily just in the specific teacher lines. It is spread through many different areas within the budget. So we just want to let folks know that it's not necessarily dollar for dollar in a salary line. I mean, it could be spread throughout the entire budget. And again, it also did allow us to bring in other positions at more competitive market rates um, for some of the non-represented. Within the expenses, and obviously, um, Chris will kick me if I, if I say something wrong here. 
For the curriculum updates and renewals, we have focused on um, the, at the high school science curriculum, computers, technology, PD areas, um, as well as continued science materials at the elementary schools. For the teacher training, we have had several professional development programs. Um, Chris has highlighted a lot of that in her updates. We have done AC, AMC math, health, PD, literacy, differentiated instruction. So we have spread that across multiple areas and we continue to roll out additional training throughout the year as well. For classroom computer replacements, we did purchase carts for the science department related to science. We are currently working with each of the buildings to look at the various, whether it's their smart board technology computers to make sure we are replenishing where the needs are. But the, the beginning of the year, the bulk of it was spent for um, the, the science department. As far as the athletic schedule and elementary chorus, because the override was passed prior to the beginning of the year, there was no impact to the athletic schedule. Everything had already been set up. We did not have to cut anything. Mm -hmm. We Earlier in the year, we did receive a question on the elementary course that was restored as part of the override. Those stipend in positions have been posted. Nobody has applied for them, so they do remain open. It's not that we do not want them. It's just that nobody has applied to, to fill them, so those do currently remain open. Sorry, I didn't know if there was a... We were wondering if anyone was interested. I, I think <laughs> you don't want to hear me to we do would, We prefer not to have tryouts right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> so we did want to, unless, you know, people wanted to have a sing-along, we could do that. Um, so we did want to spend a couple of moments, again, just high level going through the various types of funds that we have. So for us, we, we do look at it as sort of three buckets, the operating, budget which funds all of the salaries, materials, supplies, basically everything to run the day-to-day -day of the schools. That is, again, funded through primary sources of the property taxes, state aid, also known as Chapter 70 on, on the school side, excise tax fees, and if there is any sale of land. Um, we, we kept this in there just as, as a reminder that the property taxes can only increase 2.5% per year plus any new growth unless there is an override, which we were very fortunate to have last year. But just as sort of a reminder, we wanted to keep that up there for folks. And then also the other area is that at the end of the year, any money that has not been spent or encumbered does get returned to the general fund and goes towards free cash. Capital, uh, we've had a lot of discussions about that lately. That is targeted to be 5% of the operating budget. A lot of time is spent going through that, and that is could be capital improvements, whether it's roof replacements, generator replacements, turf two. Um, this year we also have the feasibility studies and the enrollment plans, master plans for the elementary schools. And it can also go, go towards more capital purchases, which would be more the vehicles and trucks and stuff like that that we have. Um, the capital funds cannot be commingled with the operating funds, so if you have funds approved for a capital project, they can only be utilized unless town meeting approves to restructure them. The schools also, we are very fortunate, we have grants and we also have the revolving funds. Those two sources of funds can only be utilized for the purpose of those funds, so the grants can only be utilized based upon how you write the grant, and the revolving funds can only be utilized for the purpose. So one of the biggest items is full day K. We can only use the money within the full day K revolving account towards expenses associated with full day K. The school department is comprised of the five cost centers that we just went through, the administration, regular day, special ed, we have lumped together um, four smaller cost centers into what we call district-wide programs, which is athletics, extracurricular, health services, and networking and technology infrastructure. And then the last one that we have is the school custodians. Annually, the school committee votes on a total budget figure as well as a budget figure for each individual cost center. We cannot transfer funds between cost centers unless we go through the process we just went through. 
this evening to have the school committee approve transfers. Town meeting approves the bottom line budget, so whatever the bottom line number is, that is the number that gets brought forth. Even though we spend a lot of time walking through everything, they approve the final bottom line number. I'll go through these relatively quickly. None of the cost centers have changed, but again, this is to just give people the refresher. Administration is currently the smallest cost center. That is the central office staff. Um, so the administrators, as well as our support staff, all of the legal, so any of our um, outside legal when it comes to employee relations issues or contract negotiations, as well as our mandated audit that we have every year of our end of year report. Jen is part of our cost center as well, so any of the hiring, recruiting, um, physicals we have done with folks, a portion of um, Julian Carr's salary goes in there because he does help manage some of the central office staff. The tax sheltered annuity for the teachers runs through, as well as our miscellaneous supplies, copier, paper. Regular day is, yep, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Tax, the tax sheltered annuity, do a lot participate in that? No, well, no it's, um, last year we had a pretty significant spike it leveled off this year, so um, we do know last year the RTA did a big push to get people to do it. I always look at it as you're leaving free money on the table. If you don't, it's 175 per teacher who's eligible to participate. Right, it was definitely down from last year. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So for regular day, that includes um, all of the building administrators, so all of your principals, secretaries, all of your reg ed teachers, tutors, paraprofessionals, um, any of the specialists that are non-special ed, so your reading specialists, library media specialists, the school psychologists, guidance counselors are in there, ELL falls under reg ed, and then all of the other items that you see in there, except for the, the transportation, all of the building-based budgets that the principals have, so when we talk about their per pupil, that's all within here as well. Our regular ed um, also houses our mandatory transportation, so that is our busing for students that live more than two miles for K to six, as well as homeless transportation oh. falls within this area as well. Um, we currently do have a fee bus as well, so any differential between the amount of money we receive and what it costs us to run that bus would also fall in here as well. Mm -hmm. um, all of the curriculum, professional development, and classroom technology also falls within regular education. The special education cost center, similar structure, that would include all of the special education administrators, so um, within Sharon's world, it would be herself, her administrative assistant, all of the team chairs, the PCBAs. Um, the largest areas within here are the legal services, all of our out of district transportation and tuition would also fall. And anything, the distinction is anything that is purely just for special education students would fall in here. If it is items that is utilized for both, it would fall within the regular regular day cost center. So people often ask about <coughs> curriculum and books and materials. Those would fall under regular education because we have one curriculum used throughout the district. This is just for items specifically tied to special education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I just ask, oh, sorry. Um, quick, and then Mr. Bobbin. The testing, on back on that uh, special ed. So the testing yeah. and assessment, yeah. is that, um, that's for any any student testing that's needing. So if you have a child and you're like in that process of sort of identifying a need, yep, it includes it's a diagnostic that. eligibility test. Okay, for an, all students, whether as a result of that testing, they may become they may eligible or not. Correct. We have to go through the testing to determine if they're eligible for special ed. Okay. But it's not for all students. It's only for no. Well, I mean, may require that. yes. Yes, I'm. Just, I guess. Yeah. You, it's like you have a regular, I have a, a regular ed student. I, my son 
you know, they, they, they have to evaluate. I'm just saying, like, that's what that's yeah. for. That's not just for students who have already been identified as special needs right. or on I Right. I right. No, that's an in important distinction. We have to do it every three years for those who are already identified, so we still have to keep doing that every three years at the, at the minimum. Yeah. But there's the initial evaluation costs, and that Which may or may not yield a student as eligible. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. That's what so. I was just understanding. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bob. Yeah, so are, are all legal costs either special ed or yes. administration? And what, what goes in one and what doesn't do? The administration is employee-related matters. So if we have any employee um, disciplinary issues or consults that we're doing, the negotiations that we have for all of our contracts would be within regular education. The special education is the legal consults for. Mm -hmm. Re related to any of the differences of opinion that may surface on student cases or any of the uh, required legal proceedings that we may engage in. It's also any student Student's service. service. Uh, for example, when we legal get our handbooks reviewed, uh, it would be this yeah. legal consult that would be. Which one? Special, special ed. So that we have separate yeah. legal engagement. Mm -hmm. Two, two different. Two different special ed. No, no, for our handbooks, student handbooks. To make sure that. What con concept? No, we use the legal our the legal services. Out of special ed. It's our legal service. That's the it's same. The it's a student service uh, legal counsel. And, so and I'd say that probably. That's not administration. No, because that administration is just for labor, employee issues. Mm -hmm. And other legal issues. I mean, we've had other legal issues in the district that would have been under the administrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying that this is that it's legal services as related to students. To students. And so the handbook fall under that because yes. it's re because it's bullying investigation. Students. You know, if we have to re oh. talk to our legal counsel about bullying oh. or harassment for st that's student based, we we use our legal counsel. Student. Oh, services. I was thinking like. You were talking about legal counsel to review the handbook. We That's do. We do use our yeah. Yeah. Student, student services. services. Student services. Really it's, it's student. Com I don't want to say versus student versus employee is mm -hmm. the distinction between the two. I think em employment uh, or other legal services okay. would either be uh, Colby or town mm -hmm. council. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So most of the Mike Joyce stuff is. Michael all Joyce is just as Michael yeah. Joyce. All student all right, services. <laughs> That's yeah, so that's all students, not just special ed. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thanks. So the district-wide program, again, is athletic, so all of the various costs associated with um, athletic. So the biggest drivers here are always the transportation as well as the facility rentals for um, pool and the ice arena. Extracurricular, that is the... Um, it, it's probably that is the smallest grouping. So it's the fees, memberships, royalties. The largest driver in there is the transportation for extracurricular. Um, also, I would say the other two large items in there are the various stipends associated with the coaching and the productions that we do. Mm -hmm. Health services that is um, the nursing, director of nursing, the nurses and their supplies. Um, the school physician, we do have an outside position that we utilize that we pay a quarterly fee to, and then any of the medical supplies and equipment. <coughs> the medical supplies and equipment, we have split. Some of our AEDs fall under health services, some of them are under athletics, especially with some of the rules that changed last year where it increased the requirement of the number of AEDs. Those are under the athletics versus nursing. And then networking technology infrastructure, this is the Julian Carr area you'll be horrified that I just said that. Um, so it includes Julie and his computer technicians, the internet software and licensing. Um, new this year when we get into the um, budgeting cycle is we are adding expenses for clocks and bells. As you know, we're replacing the phone systems in multiple of the schools over the next few years. So with that, we're also enhancing the PA systems, clocks and bells. So there'll be ongoing costs associated with that that now will fall into the cost center, um, as well as when we do any of the technology, infrastructure, capital upgrades, any of the ongoing licensing and maintenance then would fall to the operating budget. And then the school custodians, as folks are aware, there are 
sort of three arms to this area. There's the town core, the town custodian, and then the school custodians. The school custodians are under the school budget. That includes the custodial manager, um, rentals coordinator, the custodial staff, and then all of the equipment supplies that go along with that. We do want to remind the committee that we do have the cleaning services contract mm -hmm. here and at Coolidge, it is coming off of its three year agreement. So we will be going up for renewal. So we do have to build in an anticipated increase for that. That'll be part of the budget process for that one. The items that are not in the budget, um, a lot of these could be funded by grants. We're very fortunate. We get a lot of donations, also user fees and other fees we receive. Um, the before and so extended day, that's all outside of the operating budget. That's um, fully funded by fees. We receive some of our athletics, extracurricular, preschool, and full day K. We do receive fees for that go into revolving accounts that we then take offsets into the operating budget. This is a high-level summary of the grants that we are currently receiving. There have not been any significant changes on that. The one um, which is unfortunate, there previously was within the special ed realm a professional development grant. We have heard nothing on that grant this year. We are assuming that that grant probably, last year we heard in February, we have heard nothing this year. So that, that is unfortunate because we had always looked to that grant to, to sort of offset what we weren't able to do within the operating budget, but that is no longer going to be the case. And as a quick reminder, we did have the school climate transformation grant. We are in the final year of a five-year grant for that one, so that one will be falling off. This is similar to what we did last year. Here's a high level summary of the changes that have occurred within the grants. We haven't seen, which we are fortunate, we, we had started to hear that some of the grants were going to start decreasing. We were fortunate um, that that was not the case for us. We did see an increase in circuit breaker. That is um, mainly due to the state increasing the funding percentage. So we were fortunate um, for that one. And just as a reminder, we have been fortunate that we do have a year in reserve. So we use, we are using last year's circuit breaker this year, this year's circuit breaker we are using next year. So we are able to budget that fact certain with the hopes that if the state increases its funding, um, it helps us out next year. What yeah, Mr. Robinson. What did we use? I can't remember this year. We used 60%, was it? We had 65, and 65. it increased to, I want to say it, they increased it to 68 or 70 with the hopes that they might go as high as 72, but that hasn't come to yeah. fruition yet. For, for FY20. For FY20, there were talks that FY19 was going to be increased as well. So I think it all depends on where the final budget comes in. They do come out very late with the final circuit breaker numbers. So we are hopeful. Mr. Bob. So the school climate transformation grant mm -hmm. winding down this year, maybe we talk about this next week or the next meeting if you want, but I'm, I'd just be interested in what what that was funding. I know, I know it's mm -hmm. in the packets and so forth, but what are we losing by losing that grant or have we just switch op other operational funds to pay that 250K in this new budget that so we're gonna see. A good portion of that was um, there were stipended positions that last year we started to migrate into the operating budget. A lot of it was um, some professional development where we were very strategic in what we did with the professional development and definitely correct me if I'm wrong on some of no. these, was very much geared towards training the trainer so that once we had the training done, we had the capacity Building to do capacity, it. So yeah. we were, each year when we're reporting back on this grant, we have to report how we are weaning ourselves off of it. We are, this is another example where through collaboration with the town, we are very fortunate that 
as part of the community priorities, the one item we did speak to the town and then brought forth to the financial forum was we still had one position that was funded on the grant. That is one of the community priorities, so that is now, that was funded in our operating That's budget this year. Yeah. Um, that was uh, 70,000 70, for 70. the... All right, so we'll, we'll, I'm just looking ahead in the slides. Um, the, the 220 is a combination of our CASA and the school climate but grant. But the school climate grant is not in the budget we're in now. That was right. gone last No, school no, climate is still this year. It ends September 30th. This is the last year. Yeah. So, it was so I, I mean, like, my interest is just tracking what happens when we have grant money and, and a sizable amount, 250K a year and a $45 million budget, but that's still a big chunk of our money. I, I'm just very aware of the, the possibility of shifting more operating funds in to fill in what used to be yep. grant money so that it becomes part of the yep. operating budget and everybody's paying for it and in the habit of paying for yep. it. And, it starts we've to been, go from a gift to big like We've been very strategic last year. Um, one of the positions we did pull into the operating budget was the data, data coach. coach. Data coach. Data, data coach. So that was a position that used to be funded out of the grant that last year we brought into the operating budget knowing we were in the last year. Mm -hmm. This year would have been the last year for the behavioralist behavioral and net. Yeah, well, Behavioral, behavioral health, health coach. coach. Yeah, let's get it way too. Who w is in currently in the grant? It is now part of the community priority. So that one has been funded in the grant. And then, like I said, for the other professional development items, we have been very strategic in the classes we have sent people to, and the people we've had come on site that we knew that they were sort of the. We're going to do it this year, train the trainer so that we would not be looking to yeah. bring those in. I, there are a couple of <coughs> items that we have built into the grant. Um, might have been more licensed type items that we had done out yeah. of the grant. So yeah, um, we've we been. Did, we mm -hmm. did appreciate that. We'll pick the budget discussion. Yep. Now. We, we can, we sure have a list of, yep. of those yep. items. We defer that. So, so in other words, where is that yep. 250,000? Oh. Are, we, are we still paying for some part of that? Mm -hmm. Right, so as you were just going through that process, you sort of move yourself off and incorporate strategically into the operating plan. But it's a tiny issue. You don't, you never leave the grant money on the table, right? No, no, no. No, 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 no,
either just not do it anymore or try to absorb it somewhere, we should also, the third part of that conversation mm -hmm. should be, does it be now be, like kind of like our CASA right. becomes a, right. a community right. priority. Yeah. Sorry. So as part of the October process, the, um, the town manager with the town accountant goes through, reviews the revenues, comes up with the projections for the following year. This is the point where we do start to work with them on the accommodated costs. Again, it, it does get a little bit tricky because it happens, basically, this is really happening in September, which is for us before the school year really begins. So we're sort of using the prior year's information to help with that. Um, just as a reminder, the operating budgets for the school and the town are determined once you have the total revenue, any town priorities, accommodated cost capital, that all comes off the top and then um, the remainder is split between the town and the school. And again, for this year, there are two community priorities, which is the ARCASA, which is the funding of the two people that were on that grant, as well as the one individual that was on the school climate grant. <coughs> so, in October, the our district would have been is too low. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That is the tricky part about that line item. Um, this is, again, this is information that was presented as part of the financial form in. October uh, that Bob and Sharon had, had presented. So there were really no significant changes. They do, the, the FY19 numbers reflect the override and then for FY20 and 21, they do include estimates for, for new growth. Um, other local revenue and um, excise tax, they do try to look at the excise taxes based upon purchases of new cars and they do adjust it as they go. Um, I, the state aid is all, always a little bit of a wild card because again, all, all of our budgets are happening before the state determines their budgets. So this is one of the areas where, um, similar to the accommodated costs, if some of these line items do have shortfalls, the finance committee has agreed that part of the process is that they would step in with free cash as needed for, for these line items. And these items are reviewed throughout the year. I know, uh, yes, Ms. Bobby. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, can we go back one? It's two numbers on there that, first of all, congratulations, Reading, we've broken the sound barrier, so to speak. We're now in 100 million in revenue, which is a new, uh, some kind of milestone. Yeah. Um, but looking at the, the two numbers that got caught my eye in the lower right corner there, 2.93% increase in FY20 and 3.05% in FY21 increases. We're at a 7.87% this year, right? Yeah. Okay. Clear. We haven't had a school committee budget at level service under a 4% increase in 10 years, mm -hmm. as far as I know. So keep that in mind. And as the base gets bigger, as the, the numbers get bigger, the percentages are more dollars, of course, right? So that's something we'll talk more about, but I wanted to flag that's that's a 3% growth rate being projected after this override. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. The accommodated cost goes through the same process. Um, Benefits, again, can be a little bit tricky. You will see the, the, the increase this year, um, Bob did talk about that, the town manager, when he was going through his, his presentations. That is because as part of the override, we did ascribe a certain amount of money to benefits because we did know that there would be um, new FTEs that were added. And then um, there was a healthy discussion as part of the select board meeting as to the Art rather than science of trying to predict <coughs> where the health care costs will come out in future years. And the capital, as you can see, it also, as part of the override, a certain amount of money was also put into the capital. So that's why when you see some of the decreases in the outlying years, it's because this current year, there was a significant pop to, to the override. So you can see the projected increases, and again, the outlying years are best estimate as of now. Those will be re 
refined next year as we go through this process again. Does, Ms. Robbins. does that debt uh, inside, the, does that include interest costs in there as well? Because it used to be we broke, Paul, I don't know, we used to break that out. It doesn't show up anywhere. The interest, the interest on the debt inside yeah. the levy is in that number too. Is it buried in there? Yeah. I think it, I'm trying to look at his. The, these are all. These are. That, I just, you know, uh, there is interest yeah, included in within that number. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, do. I have to go down to line 100. The, uh, the reason why I ask, that's something you always got to keep an eye on, especially yes. as interest rates are going up right now. We can't keep. Yeah. You know, we got to be careful what we include in the levy, and, and mm -hmm. as opposed to right. going to the taxpayers. Right. So that's a FinCom discussion again. Sorry. Mr. Bob. <clears throat> the education out of district. So I see the 12.1 percent there for this year, and we've talked about that. But I see 5 percent, 5 percent yeah, after which that, is, which mm -hmm. really has my attention mm -hmm. given the conversation we had tonight. And I know the uncertainty is probably a floor of. It's at least this, yeah. but it could double mm -hmm. easily. Yes. And, and on that kind of dollars, that, that's, that could really create havoc elsewhere in the budget yep. for, yep. for these projections. Right. That uh, watch that's out that. Right. That, yes. Those 5% numbers are not, it's not realistic. Not really no, that, I don't think that's realistic at all. Right. Um, and, and given what we saw tonight, where we're already 5% we're already off right. on our own projections, right? For, if you add up the last three consecutive mm -hmm. quarters, and that's not even a full year. No, it's because we made a conscious decision not to. Yeah. Normally, we would have would have right. had something in in the budget. No, I get that. I just want these are these are things on numbers, right? right? These are these are not coming. So I just want to make sure that that. Yeah, these, right. these, these are estimates. Right? These are estimates that I are presented as part of when we're doing the financial form in October, based on sort of best. So yes, we, don't own, we don't own all of those numbers as a school committee. The only one that we're correct. like correct. responsible for is that one line item, is my point. Correct. And I don't want to compare apples and oranges on these types of tables and have one line that has enormous uncertainty that mm -hmm. not commensurate with the uncertainty for all the other lines. Especially when it's a number like that where we think it's a very high level uncertainty. It'll get 500 to a million dollars off on those second and third year projections. And that really could disrupt the ability to protect across the right. whole budget. So if, if that's going to be updated, so that's as of the October 10th uh, financial forum, if this is going to be updated, then I think we need to be talking about what those percentages so are. So no? it, it will not be updated oh. now unless we, those are the discussions that we would be, be having. I would say the FY21 is a more realistic number that we will be updating those would be discussions we would be having as part of this process if we needed to look for additional funding for accommodated costs those would be discussions that would be held through the budget process you don't have a we don't have a mechanism now to, to do, change to that, that number this, this was voted okay. on and approved right. by the okay. finance committee again october 10th based upon information that was provided in september to Finance committee, so that's why there's this okay. lag. So now, once we are establishing this year's, that will become the okay. base for next year. But we need to just be <coughs> yes. discussing it differently this this year. Yes. I think it's important to the, you know look at the sum of the parts. I mean, that's you know two point nine yeah. percent is you know, manageable from the town's full town stamp. Mm -hmm. Are you saying it, because of the relative percent that is compared to benefits? Is that no, just oh. the overall oh. increase in accommodated costs is right. Am I reading that right? Right. That is. The that is yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I was going to say I feel like it wasn't that many years ago when the um, out of district was really quite managed mm -hmm. because they've been so successful at pulling programs in. Wouldn't you say? Or I think it was we. Right. Yes, it, it ebbs and flows. Yes, yes. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. So is anything you change here, you know, the out years to be higher than that higher percentage, you're just squeezing something out. Right. Well, what you're squeezing are the, is everything that's not accommodated. That's right. That, that's okay. what's getting squeezed. So that's why we try to right. manage it, and that's why we'll, we're starting to have, right. and the unfortunate thing is it does happen basically 
well in advance of when the we have The set reality numbers. is, though, you squeeze it, you know, you here, and you take it out of accommodated, and then, you know, there's a, there's a pot to divide, or we're doing what we did tonight, to, as to Nick's point, mm -hmm. $700,000 and two hundred and fifty is just starting the, the rodeo yep. now. But there's a story that why we're doing that this year. Yes. It's not yeah. a normal occurrence mm -hmm. uh, that so much. The abnormal becomes the normal. Yeah. No, that's what we're getting watching. Yeah. <coughs> so the only part of accommodating, aside from the special ed items, is again we do have the community priorities for the two grants that are ending. The Arcasa is 150 thousand of it, and that is to fund the two positions. That is part of the police department budget, and that was all presented as part of the select board presentations earlier in December, and then within the school department, we do have the position um, funded that we had discussed. This slide is a um, high-level summary of how the numbers look for the current year, and these are the numbers as presented as part of the financial forum, so that is, are the numbers that we will be <coughs> working towards for <coughs> FY20. FY21 is put up there mainly as just a high-level estimate. Again, those numbers will be refined next year as part of the October financial forum process. And then, and that's for schools, right? Correct. Yeah, just the school piece. Yeah, so again, we're at this 8.3% in FY19 mm -hmm. with the override, but Correct. then we're in unprecedented reductions mm -hmm. in level service to be under 4% at like 3% for level service budget. I, I'm not aware of when we've done that in the last in the last 10 years, so I hope we can do that, but those are, I would characterize it as aggressive projections given past growth rates. Mm -hmm. So I hope we can do that. That would match FinCom guidance, and that would that would be sustainable. But we've never we've never been that low without making cuts. Right. So. Well, I should say in ten years that. Yeah, you don't want to come off this great override, and then mm -hmm. saying, "Gee, we're, we can't. We're cutting our level right. service." Right. Just yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so um, as we go through. The process typically, what we do each year is we make sure we're aligning what we're funding with the district priorities. Again, as we've gone through the superintendent's goals over the past couple of meetings, we do know that there'll be a new district improvement plan. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the areas, so focus on equity and access for all students, school safety, physical and psychological, part of that will be capital funding that we've talked about as well as operating funding, but we felt it was important to do both as we start to progress through the capital funding. Closing the achievement gap, social emotional learning. We are constantly <coughs> looking at maintaining class sizes as well as the middle school model that we talked about lo a lot last year. So some of the drivers as we go through the budget, um, we do, we are very fortunate. We now have all of our um, unions have settled three-year contracts, so now we do know fact certain what the increases will be for the next two budget cycles, which um, from my standpoint is a relief, it's having huge. built two budgets without mm -hmm. no uncertainty in that mm -hmm. area. This, this does give me a, a little bit more comfort in doing it. Um, we are, as we talked about, again, I. I, I almost put it in a larger font and bolded it. We are seeing increases in special education, so that will be one of the main drivers of the budget as we go through. Um, as Chris has been talking about in her updates, we, we do know that there are curriculum updates in social studies that we will need to align to, so we need to make sure we have appropriate funding. That'll be a two-year funding process. We have two years for the social studies. So yeah. We want to make sure we're being cognizant of that. Um, we do. What grade levels? All grade levels. Oh, we're wow. We're starting with middle school. We're doing some auditing of high school. And then for 2020 uh, 21, we'll implement elementary and the tweaks that we have to make to high school. But next year, our plan is to spend most of our money in middle school, which is the most impacted with the new curriculum changes at uh -huh. the state level. Mm -hmm. Great. 
So when we look through these three years we have on these charts for 2021, other than social studies, are there other curriculum updates you anticipate yes. starting after, like that, that would have us be a cost driver after this year. So we're done with science, right, this year? Mm -hmm. So we're less and now we're doing social studies. Well, we're, you know, one Double of the things that I will be presenting in uh, later this spring is about the cur curriculum renewal process mm -hmm. and really getting sort of all subjects and all grades on sort of this, if I think of it as a clock. Mm -hmm. So 12 o'clock is like brand new, mm -hmm. and then we go around uh, so that we're constantly looking at that. So I'll be talking about that later on in the year, but we do have, um, we do have some ideas about that and how we're going to sort of get some systems in place so that we're always aware of what's coming up. It'll be great for budgeting because you'll know at 12 o'clock these departments, these grades will be in 2021, 2022, those kind of things. We don't really have that structure in place right now, but we're building it. It's a preventative maintenance plan for yeah. a curriculum. We are building it. In what we, on your car for lunch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what we've been doing as we go through, similar to the IT life cycle, to the point we are doing digital curriculum, we are also making sure we are building out because you you do sort of have the ebbs and flows where you, you sign up for three to five years, depending on the pricing subscriptions. You We have to remember every three to five, you will have that renewal come in. So we're also looking to make sure we're staggering them, we're doing what we can so we don't have everything hitting all, all at once. Is, is the labor cost, the FTE cost, can you comment on how that compares with these other costs in the second bullet point and following. So if bullet point one is, is what I characterize as labor costs, mm -hmm. it's what's we're contractually, contractually obligated to invest in our people. Mm -hmm. um, it's their salaries, it's mm -hmm. their stipends, and, yeah. um, et cetera. How does that total compare with the total of everything else in the cost driver list? That would be the most significant yes. since like we're about 86% yeah, staff. Yeah, almost 90%. Yeah. 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 So it's 85% yep. plus is bullet fixed. point one and 50% yep. everything else. Mm -hmm. So right. our FTE is our money. Correct. Oh, yeah. Pretty much. Although yeah. That's our assets walk out the door every day. It's the people. Mm -hmm. yeah. The uh, transportation. But that, that's so why I pick up adding FTE. When we add FTE, that's what's driving bullet point one. Right, bullet point two is the next, probably the it next would considerable be the next one. Significant yeah. one. So then what we also have, we are entering into the, which I would recommend, so we, we have the two renewal options on our bus contract from what we are seeing, given the prices, we do feel that the, it would make the most sense to execute on the fourth and fifth year options within the contract. Um, based upon what we're currently seeing. So that impacts regular day as well as athletics and extracurricular. Mm -hmm. um, um, Dr. Docs, I have a question. I'm sorry, I'm backing up just one step in terms of the curriculum and you talked about the social studies curriculum. I know that there was legislation that passed for civics. Mm -hmm. Is that within the social yes. studies? So that, <coughs> that, is, that is civics curriculum is eighth grade. So the eighth grade is brand new. So we're working, we're just starting right after the holidays with the social studies subcommittee to start building some of that curriculum. They actually Thank call you. it civics? Civics. Civics, yeah. yeah. Cool, that's right. Wow. Throwback. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are. All right. As I mentioned previously, we are coming off of a three-year contract for the cleaning contract. We will be using combines in the state bid list. We do reach out to folks ahead of time, so we have an estimate of what they believe the increases can be. A lot of it is tied to, we have seen increases in minimum wage laws, a lot of the paid leave acts, which do impact mm -hmm. a lot of our vendors, so those costs will start to get passed through to clients. Um, and the other area which does start to impact us is a lot of our significant capital projects. When we do the capital projects, we always try to lump in three-year maintenance agreements. So we do have a couple of those that are coming up to their three-year renewal. So it'll be the first time they're going through <coughs> the operating budget. So we are seeing some increases tied to that. So communication process will be the same as it has been. We are. Um, still utilizing the budget liaisons. We feel that that is a good group of individuals. Um, we do try to get a good cross-section from all the schools. We do reach out to members of CPAC as well as members of the community. We feel they can help us 
um, getting the information out. We do the budget bulletins as part of the weekly journey newsletter. We have the school committee meetings, and after each meeting, we will be posting the information on the webpage as well, so people have the presentation, the budget books, questions, and all of that information mm -hmm. as well. So similar process to what we've utilized in the past. We did want to spend a quick moment on the calendar of events we do, which I believe has been communicated to the committee. Yeah. We did make one slight change um, based upon looking at the calendar. We had the first budget meeting slated for January 3rd, which we realized meant that basically everyone would enjoy New Year's Eve with the budget book, which we realized was probably not the best timing to send the information out as much as I'm sure everybody wanted to be reading it on New Year's Day. We did, we did. <laughs> and I was very excited to have to get the budget book out, basically. <laughs> on New Year's Eve. <laughs> on, before New Year's Eve. Yeah. Um, and we just thought timing-wise, too, that first week in January is also a very difficult week if we want to make sure we're getting the most attention as we could. We didn't feel that that Thursday with everyone just getting back from the holiday break made sense. So we have shifted um, the meetings slightly. So the first meeting will be on January 7th. The presentations will stay the same. We'll do um, high level overview just to kind of walk through where we are. We'll do the administration, call center, district wide, school facilities and capital. And then the next meeting will be regular day and special ed. We did say we wanted to combine the two of those such that the public public hearing would have its own meeting that would allow for the hearing as well as any questions. And then a separate meeting for any final questions as well as the final vote. So that is um, slated for January 28th and then that would still allow us to ensure we had the budget to the town manager by January 31st. We are currently slated for February 27th to present the budget to um, the Finance Committee, and then they will wrap up their process um, mid-March in time to vote for the Warren articles for the April Town Meeting. Okay, so the 7th is a Monday, Correct. the 17th is a Thursday, the 24th is a Thursday, the 28th is a Monday. Correct. Correct. Lightning round. All right. Motion to adjourn. Oh, make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Okay. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You very Thank much. you, everyone. Have a nice break.